Good evening and welcome to the Human Relations Commission regular meeting of April 11th, 2019. We begin with a roll call. Chair Kralik? Present. Commissioner Lee? Present. Commissioner Onan? Commissioner Smith? Present. Commissioner Stinger? Present. Vice Chair Shu? Present. Thank you. Uh, agenda changes, requests, and deletions. I move the agenda as is. Okay, uh, not hearing any. We'll move forward with oral communications from the public. We do not have any public comment cards. We'll begin with the business of the commission, uh, the learning series. <coughs> we have a presentation by Avenidas regarding their transportation programs and about their programs for immigrant communities. Okay, great. Great, well, it's my great pleasure to um, introduce um, Jillian Halliburton, she is the volunteer director for Avenidas. Jillian, why don't you come join us here at the table? Jillian, welcome, and thank you for uh, sharing your time with us this evening. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So I will. Um, just you guys vote. Do you want me to run the? Um, oh yeah. Why don't you oh, sit down I here? I'm sorry. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it doesn't have a, a clicker, so. Well, we'll do our best to have the camera focus on you instead of on yeah. any of us. Oh, so. okay. <laughs> Jillian, do you want us to? <laughs> so our ratings will improve. <laughs> did you want us to uh, hold our questions until the very end, or did you want us to ask them as we go along? What is your, your preference? I'm fine with whatever you guys want to do. Does the chair have a preference? Oh, yeah, okay. let's, okay. let's hear the whole presentation. Okay. Uh, I'm learning. Uh, you know, okay. I think I will just tell you my background. I was uh, living in Pleasanton for about 10 years before I moved here uh, to Palo Alto, and we had a senior center. We had a, a fairly huge senior center with a lot of activities for a lot of uh, different groups. And uh, so Avenida seems to me to be taking that uh, role here in Palo Alto, and I, I'd love to hear about what you're doing. Okay, great. Um, I don't, am I being heard? You are. It's not, okay, it doesn't sound it's like it to me. It's not a true projection. Okay, that's, oh yeah, it didn't, okay, I was wondering. Um, yeah, so so uh, there's there's so much more that we do at Avenidas besides what I'm presenting here, but you know, today I was focusing on the transportation specifically and um, the programming that we've been doing to reach out to immigrant communities. Um, so, but if you, if you have additional questions about Avenidas, I'm happy to answer about any of our programming, so. Um, but I'll, so I'll go ahead and start with um, our, so our current, our current transportation um, program uh, encompasses sort of three things in my mind. Um, we have our own volunteer driver program, uh, which has been around for I think probably about 15 years. I've been running it for about seven. Um, it, uh, we, basically what we do is with volunteer drivers using their own cars, we provide uh, medical, social, and um, basically any type of ride, you know, to people who are no longer driving so that they stay engaged and active and healthy in the community. Um, in addition to that, uh, supplementally to the door-to-door -door program, we use Lyft. We were actually one of their beta tester uh, sites that they originally started with, with the concierge tool that is now kind of a pretty widespread thing that they use with, it's a, it's a business model desktop version of Lyft, um, different from the app on your phone. And we use that to, um, schedule uh, rides, as I said, for door-to-door for -door when we're short on volunteer drivers, but we also um, use it for you know, on-demand rides as well. We can actually go outside of our usual coverage area to then what the volunteers normally do by using Lyft. Um, and then we also do teach workshops on how to use Lyft on your phone for those seniors who are more tech savvy and interested in doing that so they have the empowerment to do their own rides. Um, we're probably going to also add Uber to that. It's just that because we had the partnership with Lyft, we kind of focused on Lyft, but we'll probably. Yeah, and, and we really actually really liked their model. Uh, when we met with both companies, they were very eager to work with us, and they you know started the company with a little bit more of a community focus and a safe ride mindset that we liked, um, which is why we picked them. Um, we've actually been working with them now for three years. Um, we also, uh, Avenues Village was also um, used as the pilot. The Avenues Village is a, an additional program that we have that allows seniors to stay in their home 
um, on a on a larger level than what Avenidos provides at a, at a membership cost. Um, and um, we actually were part of a pilot program that Uber did to um, with a caregiving agency as well, which led to their new Uber Health you know rides that they do. Um, so we might actually start working with Uber as well in the future using those types of rides. The other thing that we provide at Avenidas is we are a source for you know transportation information. Um, I have had uh, some various volunteers who've been part of the ambassador, uh, like senior mobility ambassador programs that the VTA and Sam Trans do that have been able to be on site and train people how to use transportation. And I would like to try to bring that back. Um, uh, we also have, have we also house the schedules for VTA, Sam Trans, Marguerite, and you know City Shuttle in our in our downtown location, um, and they're sort of a hub for transportation. So we also put out a, a resource list, um, which I show there, the para, paratransit and private transportation agencies as well as public transportation, um, which helps people because with our door-to-door -door program we we cannot provide paratransit because we're using volunteers with their own cars. Um, so, and we're actually uh, revamping our website, and, and I hope to have a really great interactive page that's transportation transportation specific with that information. Yeah. How, sig how, sig mm -hmm. how significant is the transportation component in the overall um, scope of Avenidas? It sounds like it's like a real linchpin. I just don't want to. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, let's see. We we provide about last year. We provided three thousand six hundred rides. Um, we don't uh, so we don't so much provide rides to Avenidas, uh, but rather provide rides to seniors to be to get out of their homes, either to get to medical appointments or social outings or running errands, grocery shopping, that sort of thing. Um, it is it is just pivotal and you know just amazing for the people who need it. Um, you know, overall numbers. Um, I, you know, I don't, I, I, I don't know percentage wise. I could probably get back to you on that about like how many people are actually, um, you know, clients of transportation and members, that sort of thing. Um, but it's it's very crucial to the people who rely on it, and it really helps. Uh, it ties in with our social work services because it really helps people from declining by being isolated at home. You know, so so the value that it brings, even if the numbers aren't huge, is is really, really valuable to those people and the, and the family members of those seniors. Um, so kind of along with what I just said, um, I would say for, for Avenidas downtown, which we're now calling Avenidas at Bryant, because we now have three, basically three locations, um, m most of the Avenidas participants do drive to classes and activities here, um, uh, which I have a future slide, but you know, we are gonna try to work on that a little bit <laughs> because you know parking is an issue and um, I know that we're, there's been a lot of city effort to try to reduce you know traffic flow downtown and I've been on a lot of you know committees working on that in the past um, uh, a lot of people do walk uh, because we are close in proximity to several senior residential uh, facilities like Channing House, Webster, Lytton Garden so we do get people walking over um, they do take rides uh, sometimes if they're you know coming for a class or something to Avenidas and um, do also get rides from family, friends, or fellow classmates. There are people who take uh, the bus, and I would say there are very few people who actually bike um, to Avenidas. We do have more people biking at Coverly. So I was trying to differentiate the population and the transportation between sites. So here's the next one is Coverly. Um, some things are similar, but I would say there, there are probably more people taking the bus and biking uh, to Coverly. Um, and uh, again, walking if they live at Stevenson House, which is pretty close by, or there's some other um, senior residential um, facilities that are also in Mountain View that are close by because we're right at the border. Um, <coughs> and then um, we do get people carpooling for this uh, for the new Chinese uh, senior program programming uh, initiative that we're doing, which I'll go into in later slides. We do have more carpooling going on for classes. Um, as well as, as the bus activity and the ride share, uh, where a family either um, use you know lift to plan a ride for their parent, you know, or the person themselves, the senior themselves, will do it. Um, and we do have people at Coverly uh, coming from everywhere from Redwood City to Campbell, which is which is pretty good. That we're going a little further south, I think, because we're further south. You know, we're located further further south than we typically would for Bryan Street. Um, and then uh, we, we have added also 
uh, at Coverly a special voicemail line um, that is bilingual because we are trying to attract more uh, Chinese seniors and eventually other populations as well, but because the Chinese population is the largest one in Palo Alto, we're starting with that. And so we're, we're hoping that we can um, invite people to call if they have questions about all the programs, including transportation. Do you happen to have a sense of sort of what the breakdown is between the different transportation modalities? Is it 50% who are driving versus 40% walking? Or just generally speaking, what? How would you weigh the difference? Um, you know, uh, um, on my on my things we're going to do in the future slide, I have a survey <laughs> on there, um, so I, I I can't answer you uh, like with actual data, but I just know from working there for 14 years that a lot of people drive. <laughs> I would say it's probably you know a much higher percentage I think that drive. Unfortunately, we're that's, and we are going to try to work on that because mm -hmm. we we do want um, we do want to change that. You know, but it's just it's uh, I think I think this. The, the older generation in this town is used to driving, and they will just drive until they don't have until they can't anymore. Often, you know. And then the the population who may no longer be able to drive, do you find that they are able to find suitable alternatives to to get to avenues or get um, elsewhere through the various programs that you offer? Or is there a segment that that are being sort of lost because they they can't drive or access one or the other? Um. I think that um, I think we do a pretty good job with outreach. So I mean, I think people do know about our transportation program. Um, so I don't think there's probably a, a huge group that's lost. Um, but you know, it's hard to know that because if you don't have a measurable of you know people who are not reached, it's kind of hard to say. We d we did do a um, market research uh, project, uh, which may actually have included that. I could find out and get back to you on that. I'm not sure if they included transportation on that. Well, that's oh, probably a, mm -hmm. a good testament to to all the work that you're doing. If the, mm -hmm. the percentage of sort of lost is, is very very low, and so yeah, I mean, I you know, and I think that, you know, Aven <laughs> <laughs> well, also, I mean, I, I in a way I have it easy because I think Avenue is so well known in the community that you know people do know to come to us when they need anything, uh, you know, if they're older, and so they kind of sometimes will just call in with sort of like I need help with X, Y, and Z, and our social worker might you know lead them to all the different available resources. So in that sense, um, the outreach is easy because the name is known you know, pretty well in the community. But I think we could actually you know, still always improve our efforts in transportation outreach because um, uh, the, I think the problem that people run into too though is if they're, if they're starting to get isolated, they aren't always reaching out for themselves. Mm. So you kind of almost need to, we probably need to do more outreach toward um, adult children. And you know maybe younger seniors so that they are aware before they really need it, um, uh, because you know I think that people can start to sink into like depressions and things too if they're isolated and not getting out and they don't really like think, they always think to call. Uh, we're actually trying to work on how we also might cross market more within Avenidas because we have our handyman program, our um, transportation program, the social work program, as well as all the activities, so that we can sort of catch people. Um, you know, before they start to decline by getting them involved with whatever needs they have and kind of, um, you know, not just, not, just, not just calling to go into one siloed service, as, you know, just kind of have a broader reach, um, outreach toward everybody in the community, so. That's great. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> okay, so. Um, yeah, okay, so uh, we are planning to do, now, especially now that we're back downtown, um, we are trying to um, increase you know, awareness of, our, of the transportation options and by having more workshops and classes. Um, that will help to educate all the seniors on um, different rideshare and public transportation options and uh, help decrease um, the parking issues and the traffic downtown. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I know that's a big concern with the city. Um, we also, in a positive way, hope to encourage seniors who maybe should be limiting their driving to use safer, op safer options, but also by d doing it in an empowering and engaging way that isn't like, we're going to take your keys away <laughs> you know, like, uh, and make it a negative thing. It's like, look at all these options you have now. You live in the age of you know, Lyft and Uber plus programs like ours that can actually allow you to stay mobile, um, when in the past that wasn't an option. So um, we, we uh, we have in the past actually had um, 
uh, a, a transportation conference with uh, speakers and uh, sponsors and people who, you know, different agencies that tabled. That's, sorry, that's, I kind of skipped, that's the fourth one down. Um, and so I'd like to bring that back again. Uh, it's been a few years since we've done that. Um, it was it was quite successful, and um, it, again, it brought a positive outlook on transportation as opposed to like, oh gosh, I got to get up the keys. Um, we also uh, have in the past hosted VTA and Samtrans senior mobility specialists. We did some at Coverly too while we were there, um, and we'll continue to do more of those. They come and uh, explain to people how to actually you know, ride VTA and Samtrans. We did in the past also have a series that was initially started by the city called, I think, Find Your Way. And Avenues took that on as well, where we, where we also did take people out to literally show them, like, this is how you use the machine at the train station. You can have them lower the, the level if you need to have help stepping on, you know, and, and walk them through step by step. So I'd like to bring that back as well. Um, we, we will continue doing the, the workshops I mentioned on Lyft and Uber. Um, we also, as I said too, we'll be disseminating the transportation options, the paratransit and uh, public transportation options, um, the conference I just mentioned. And then um, I'm also uh, working with, there's a Santa Clara County Transportation Commission um, where all the nonprofits that provide transportation uh, from Palo Alto to San Jose are meeting to try to figure out how as a group we can have a little bit more power to be heard for the, you know, increased needs and demands on transportation programs. Um, and uh, in terms of reaching out to the immigrant community, we're, we're wanting to uh, translate all the materials, um, beginning with Mandarin, and then eventually we'd like to also do Russian, there's also a large population of Palo Alto and Spanish and other languages. Um, and we want to continue doing, you know, more outreach to immigrant communities. Um, and uh, also do more, as I mentioned, surveying of immigrant communities on transportation needs. Okay, um, how will we, or how, sorry, how are we engaging currently with the Chinese senior community? Um, we initiated a task force um, to come up with ideas which involve both staff and um, Chinese members of the community. Uh, who could give us input on, on, you know, sort of what would work and what wouldn't, and how to reach people. Um, we worked on that for a year, um, and we also initially uh, surveyed um, people at Stevenson House, Lytton Gardens, and other areas to ask what uh, interests uh, they had for activities. We um, create, started to create programming based on the survey results and recruiting uh, bilingual, bilingual volunteers uh, to support the programs and translate materials. Um, but the best thing that's happened so far is we were able to hire Pinky Fung, who's amazing, and she is our diversity um, outreach specialist who's, uh, again, starting with the Chinese population, but she's also going to grow the program to include other groups as well and uh, bring a lot more programming that will attract people. And um, I will be working with her on how we can um, get the transportation information out to those different groups as well. Um, she and she specifically also after after our initial survey she she also did a survey uh, as it mentions here that included uh, speaking with people who are uh, I guess Hong Kong Chinese Chinese Filipino and Taiwanese uh, members of the community um, because the language and interests can be different too so we want to make sure we cover cover everything. Um, and um, we also hired uh, Susan Lamb at our Rose Kleiner Center. I don't know if you guys are familiar with our Rose Kleiner Center. It's, a, it's an adult day health program. Uh, so people who have uh, cognitive or physical limitations, who are not independent seniors, they can go to this day-long program. They live at home with family or by themselves. And stuff. It's in Mountain View. Uh, it's located in Mountain View, but we serve the whole you know, peninsula like Avenida's does. And so uh, we have a person there who's uh, got a nursing background and she can do more medical outreach or, or outreach to medical uh, providers to let them know about the need for um, people to go to programs like this to thrive and to also to specifically reach out to immigrant communities who aren't always aware that, you know, programs like this exist and can support their families. I think Pinky is really great. I've met her a couple of times. So yeah, isn't she great? Yes. <laughs> she's just like the most enthusiastic person and and she's, you know, just multilingual and just, you know, she just draws people. She's so fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she spoke highly of you as well. So um 
So, uh, so on the note of Pinky and um, programming for the immigrant communities. Well, before I go on, do you guys have any transportation-specific questions you wanted to ask, or yeah, immigrant? Okay, okay. Anybody else? Uh, on, on transportation, uh -huh. is, is there anything that you think that the city could could do better, could assist with in terms of helping it um, make it easier for our senior citizens? to get around town, to be mobile, to be social, just to be empowered, to be engaged. Is there anything that you think we could slightly do better? Um, there, There is one thing that I think we have maybe spoken to someone in the past. I had a coordinator who um, in the past I know spoke with someone at the city. I'm not quite sure who it was, but um, there, I think in because we realized we provide so many rides uh, to peop from people's homes to PAMF all day long for open medical appointments. We were we had an idea to try to um, partner with the city shuttle f for the downtimes of the day uh, when when it's not you know running as frequently to try to ferry people to PAMF um, just because that would then you know take a little burden off the load of the volunteer drivers whose schedules are often very full and tight uh, to be able to provide additional rides. You know, not not that they wouldn't still do pamp rides, but just that um, you know we have we do have some schedules where it's just you're just back and forth someone's house, you know, and to pamp and the next person to pamp. So that you know that we would be interested in talking to, with the city about that if that were you know an option. I'm not sure. Um, that that just pops off the top of my head, but um, I could probably think of more <laughs> ways <laughs> that that we could collaborate. You know, and I think any support the city can give you know to us is great. Yeah. Yeah, I can. Think I, I just have to s interject for just a second. I used the service a lot for when, in a crisis, in several crisis situations with my mom. The ride was great, and the but more important than the ride was the attitude, the help, the outreach. The uh, dispatcher on the other end would just listen to this crisis, and I thought he's he's not going to like this, and he's no problem. He took yeah, it, and I really appreciated that attitude, and I also appreciated that you would cross the line into San Mateo. There's so many yeah. ride services or county lines, and, yeah. and they would drop mm -hmm. a senior off and then say, you've got to walk the rest of the way. It's like, I'm um, not really. And so that leads me to think about um, there might be some shopping in Redwood City that's grocery shopping that's less expensive. Mm -hmm. And um, That's more. a good point, yeah. Yeah. No, th th yeah, thank you for bringing that up. We are, uh, we are one of the few agencies that cross county lines, and so we do get a lot of a lot of uh, rides that you know would either possibly not happen or would run into a lot more red tape with the sort of you know county run programs and stuff. Um, in the Santa Clara uh, Transportation Commission I mentioned earlier, um, you know I, I I find there's a little bit more of the South Bay focus there, so that's also a little tricky because we're you know we do tend to provide rides more like Sunnyvale to Redwood City, just because of logistics and you know. Uh, proximity. Um, so we're, we're always in a little bit of a funny spot because then also with the same thing with San Mateo, or San Mateo County is that it runs up to San Mateo itself, you know, when uh, when I go to meetings and things and we kind of we kind of taper off, you know, around Redwood City, San Carlos. Um, so there is that sort of in-between peninsula area that does cross county lines and can be complicated. Uh, but and I appreciate you giving that feedback about the dispatcher. We do. That's one of the things I think that people really like about the program is not just the ride itself, but the dispatchers and the drivers um, are just wonderful, and you know, just make people feel good. And relationships develop between the drivers and the riders for years. Sometimes I have some drivers who've been driving for ten plus years, and. Um, that just that extra touch. I mean, people, you know, so if we do a lift ride, they'll say, oh, okay, that's fine, but, you know, are you sure you don't have a volunteer driver available? You know, because they really like <laughs> the ones that they know. And we do have actually one paid driver as well, part-time paid driver. And um, so we, we do definitely get the requests because of the personal connection. I think that really does help. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> I, I was very encouraged uh -huh. by some of the, um, you know, partnerships that you mentioned with Uber and Lyft. Could, could you speak to um, how those came about? Is, was that something that Avenidas had done the initial outreach to, or did they come to you? I mean, I think given that we're here in the heart of Silicon Valley, is there any extent that we can encourage and help other nonprofits sort of follow your example in terms of, you know, using tech and mm -hmm. you know, partnering with the private sector and vice versa, you know, with the public sector? I think those are all fantastic things. So 
Yeah, exactly, because we're here where yeah. it's happening. And um, we, uh, we approached them. Uh, we just thought it, we didn't actually know they had the concierge tool, but we just approached them wondering how we could have them help us provide, you know, meet the demand. Because before we used Lyft, we actually had wait lists some days and we couldn't provide an, all the rides that were being requested. So, um, and that was hard to say no to, like, you know, like you're giving the example of, you know, being in distress, you know. And so Lyft has given us that ability to fulfill the need. Um, and uh, as I said earlier too, we, did, we, we found that they were more receptive, you know, to work with us. Um, I think uh, Uber's, you know, changed over the years. Yeah. <laughs> so they, they may be a little bit more so, but, um, it would be, yeah, sorry. Uh -huh. I was just going to say, uh, Steve is going graciously give you another five minutes of his <laughs> time for okay. his presentation <laughs> because he's uh, agreed to hold all his questions until the end. Okay. <laughs> and I know we have okay. another 10 slides. Okay, so, so yeah, no, well, yeah, I'll, I'll go through them we're, quickly. So, yeah, that's fine. No, but I, I would love to talk more about <laughs> that, you know, what you're asking. Yeah. Okay. No, no, no. Um, okay, so. Uh, Let's see, I, I guess I kind of t talked on this a little bit. Um, we had this task force at first uh, for the Chinese programming um, that led us to do events for all the Chinese holidays to sort of spread the word that we were starting to do this. Uh, we hired Pinky Feng, who I mentioned, and she started to create new classes and finding you know, instructors. We uh, kicked off what we call the Culture Club, which I'll explain in a minute. Uh, and we've been doing a lot of, she's been doing especially a lot of outreach, um, like the Palto uh, Chinese School uh, outreach event at Mitchell Park, that's like 500 people. We did it last year too, it's kind of amazing. Um, and then we just did our kickoff uh, at, for Cupperly Day um, uh, on March 23rd, a few weeks ago, and we had about 250 people who came. I think you were there, right? Yeah, <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, thank you, told me. I think you're even in the picture of the little article. Um, the, the, the mission of Culture Club is what it says there, to promote health, wellness, and recreation in culturally appropriate programs to a diverse senior community and to encourage cultural sensitivity through education and community engagement. Um, and so the Culture Club, uh, um, membership that they created um, is just for a limited time and it's just a way to introduce people to this new programming because people are sort of used to what we already do so when we have something new like this we kind of have to have a way to excite them and catch them um, and uh, we're trying to actually have all the classes be bilingual or multilingual um, English Mandarin and Cantonese for the time being um, and we actually do, and we also do have non-Chinese, you know, uh, participants who are coming as well as, as, as Chinese members and, um, w which is nice because then they can, ex you know, exchange. Um, is that $20 uh, per month or is that $20 for an entire six month? Uh, I think it's, it's $20 for the six months. Oh, wow. That's a deal. Yeah. That's a deal. Yeah. Um, <laughs> our membership isn't very expensive to begin with, so. Yeah, no, I, hey, I want to take all our classes all the time. We've got a lot of good stuff going on. Um, okay, and uh, and yeah, and, and already existing members were included, you know, so that we, we could draw more, you know, people to come to the classes. Um, uh, let's see, ac access, sorry, this is actually a slide from Pinky. Uh, so the access to Culture Club uh, will be included yeah, on all levels going forward as well. And uh, just to give you an idea of what we have been doing uh, since the fall of, of last year and up till now, we've had a uh, very popular Tai Chi, although tai, Avenues has actually always had Tai Chi, it's always been a popular class. Um, we had a nutrition workshop and um, singing is, is a big, uh, from our survey, uh, singing is a, is a big uh, draw for people. And we have it in the form of karaoke and this vocal training. Um, we did some festivals, like I mentioned. There was a mid-autumn festival. We drew a huge crowd for that. And uh, then we just had this, um, the Culture Club grand opening that I mentioned. So I think you're in there. Are you, Steve? Yeah, right there, right there. Yeah. Uh, that was the ribbon cutting. And, and some of the people there were, part, were involved with the Chinese task force that initially started the programming. Um, and yeah, over, over 250 people came. Pinky had amazing dance performances. I mean, just so much going on. It was great. The other program that's staying at Coverly is another program of mine that's uh, called Avenida's Blooms in which we um, repurpose donated flowers and donated vases and deliver them to senior residential facilities. So they're gonna be sharing the space at Coverly as well as we're gonna have other programming as well. Um, but those are the two main attractions. So this gives you an idea of the things that Pinky's offering and, and how they work. As you can see, they are bilingual. 
Um, some of those were in the last slide. Uh, there's this karaoke mingle that's really popular. The Chinese brush painting is really popular, and it's really fun when it's going on because there's all this hubbub in the room. And, um, and, uh, and we always had mahjong, but there's, I guess this is mahjong brain exercise, so it's a little bit different. <laughs> And the, this uh, UNG dance is new to me. Um, it's, it, and uh, I guess it's a co combination of Tai Chi and um, dance. And then line dancing is very popular. And we're having this new jewelry making coming up in the spring. And there's some other classes too that are coming, but that's just a sampling. Um, oh, here, sorry. Ping pong. Lotus dance is something we've been offering for a long time. It's very popular. It's kind of a mix of like everything hip hop and Polynesian dance and different Asian style of dancing. Um, and uh, this is what she was just mentioning, the events that she's doing. So this is uh, what she would like to bring in the future. Um, again, this is the result of surveys that we've done uh, and what people are asking for. Um, and uh, Let's see. And then um, just to give a current snapshot of what's been going on since we started the Culture Club, uh, we've got actually 70 new um, non-English speaking new immigrants who've joined, which is actually quite great. <laughs> it's pretty high. Um, most instructors are, as I mentioned, um, actually most of them are trilingual, um, uh, definitely bilingual, so they can engage everybody who comes. And um, we've ha been having, as I said, like a nice blending of both the English and non-English speakers so that they can make friends and learn about it in other cultures and just get engaged. Um, so that's, that's sort of the snapshot of what we're doing and um, tying that back to the transportation. As I said, Pinky and I will be working together too on how we might better communicate to the people coming to Coverly for these classes on how we can provide transportation to them specifically. Uh, but both, you know, through translation of uh, information and, and, and hitting the right targeted outreach locations and, you know, events to, to communicate that. Would you share a little bit about yourself and how you became interested oh. in this uh, mission? And and working in MS. <laughs> uh, well, okay, uh, yeah, sure. I'm actually from Palo Alto. I'm born and raised here. Um, uh, although I didn't live here, you know, continuously, but when I came back to the community, I had a friend actually who worked uh, at Avenida. She was the grant writer at the time. So that's how I learned about it. And I worked in biotech, which is interesting, but wasn't really my thing. Uh, and so when I heard about the position opening, I, I jumped on it because I was always wanting to move into the nonprofit sector. My dad at the time too had been diagnosed with Parkinson's and I just wanted to be able to spend more time with him and kind of get more um, introduced to the world of aging and all that to kind of take that journey with him. And so um, I uh, was really happy to have had that all happen at the same time because then I was able, he had Parkinson's for 12 years before he passed away. And so we were able to, you know, just spend time together and I was able to help him, which was nice. And um, and I love what I do. I love working with the volunteers. We have actually 375 approximately volunteers total for all of our programs. I didn't really go into the volunteer program here except for the transportation program, um, but uh, we have a lot of thriving programs that, again, you know, engage seniors to stay active, and, and the volunteers tend to be probably the, you know, most, um, most, most active and independent and healthy uh, seniors, and, and they're, you know, just really interesting and fun to work with, really amazing people. Um, so that's what I love about it. We're very grateful for your time, and we're very Thank grateful you. for your commitment, and uh, Commissioner Brombot's here, and, and maybe she has a question about the transportation. I don't know if you, you have a thought about it or. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, you have her you. blessing. Yeah, okay. No. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Very good. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you. Uh, we're going to move to a uh, short discussion of the updates to the Emerging Needs Fund policy. Uh, staff has the action step here. So, Mika, uh, would you help us through that? I do. I had to get my glasses on, but now I can see. So, um, Emerging Needs Fund, as you saw from my, my background or piece, has been around for about two years. Um, council was gracious in um, offering um, $50,000 a year to help meet um, emerging and critical needs between the, the HISRAP time periods. And it's been operational for a couple years, so I thought 
it was a good idea to look at the policy and to see, you know, what's working, what's not working. I sent it out to the commissioners, several of you, at least three quarters of you have been at least on one of the um, subcommittees to review an application. I took the ideas that I got um, back in and I came, I made some drafts to this. So I would suggest maybe if you take out the, the copy that says draft revised copy and then I'll just kind of go over. I have my copy that kind of goes over the changes. I had at one point thought I'd give you the one with track changes and it just became too um, cumbersome to work for. I did give you the current copy, but I don't even think that's that helpful to do a comparison now. So I'd kind of like to go over the draft um, um, changes and um, then open it up for questions and comments. And then at that time, I'll take any more suggestions and, um, and we'll go from there. So um, at this point, the draft changes um, is the name and that's something I'm totally open for suggestions. I really actually don't think this name works. I think it's too close to the HisRap name to work, but I couldn't think of anything and I needed to get this out to you all. So I just left it at that, but it, it, if as things go as it's currently written here, it's gonna be a little beyond just calling it an emerging needs fund. That really wasn't a, a true reflection of, of what it was. So, um, so that was one thing I'd like to look at. Um, so one of the, the key um, changes that I made is to um, change it from three years to two years. I think we had it at three years at first, probably for a couple of reasons, probably so it wasn't exactly the same as his rap, and also because we didn't want people asking for money again too quickly. Well, that has actually turned out not to be the case. People are not asking for money um, as quickly as we thought they were, and um, I, th I thought it was fine to, to move it to two years. Grants up to 10,000. I know there were some that felt like, you know, you haven't got that many requests. You know, we'd love to be able to, if someone has a great project to be able to get to 10,000, I strongly recommend ag against that for the following reason. Um, 10,000 is actually a pretty decent grant amount. There are a lot of the HISREP grantees that are at the $10,000 level. They also filled out a 40 page application and were scrutinized over multiple meetings to get that 10,000. These folks for these programs, it's, it's 10 questions, no more than three pages. And I really feel like to, to give an agency more than 10,000, I really want to do due diligence on behalf of the city and have them take the time to fill out a more a fuller application to get a better sense of their organization. So I am, I am strongly um, recommending against any um, increase to that. The other thing that I, I did was in taking some of the suggestions from folks is um, you'll see here instead of just emerging and critical needs, I put emerging critical and I took, let me back up, emergency needs were always there. That's pretty um, much the same. What I did take off because it just didn't seem to be necessary anymore is some qualifications like all applicants could qualify for this. If you're his rep grantee, this is your subsection of this policy. And really looking at it, that just didn't seem to be necessary anymore. So I took that away. So the emergency needs language is pretty much the same. I think I, um, uh, at, at Mary's um, suggestion and our earlier oversight, I added fire um, to that. Then I, I divided up emergency and critical need. And critical needs are um, pretty similar to what it was before. I think I added the word urgent. That was a suggestion that um, came up to me. Although the first line says that wasn't evident during the original HISRAP funding period, that's just a trigger for people that are in HISRAP, but I didn't feel the need to then put parentheses HISRAP grantee only. 
Then I added um, this third one, or changed its meaning a little bit to the emerging needs. And um, that says, a need that has not come up before or the approach to addressing the need is new, even though it may not rise to the level of an emergency or critical need. I think that was really a barrier to a lot of people when they looked at the application. They say, you know, this is a real need in the community, but can I really provide the documentation that says it's an emergency or it's um, critical? but it's still a very in, important um, need. The second thing I added is, um, and Mary and I did a lot of wordsmithing on this, is, um, and this was based on suggestions that I, I got in, is to, to develop or expand a program or service that will enhance the quality of life for vulnerable populations. I just didn't want to open it and say, hey, anybody have an idea? We're here for your idea. You know, but I did feel like, well, if there is a need and um, what, you're, what you will be doing will be addressing the need of very vulnerable population in our community, I, I wanted an opportunity for this grant program to be able to consider that. I also added, um, as you will see, um, that grant requests will be prioritized for funding in the order of need below. As it stands now, we get maybe one, maybe two applications per application deadline. So this need to prioritize it based on the level of need really hasn't come into play. But I did want that in there, for instance, if with this expansion of the grant, if it is approved, I wanted that opportunity to say, okay, we had this agency lose um, all their equipment to do X, Y, Z, and they'd like to start a new program. Yes, it will affect frail elderly seniors, and it's important, but this agency is going to be non-operational in this area. And I wanted some guidance to the review committee to be able to say, hey, are we given some guidance on what is more important, not just our personal opinion? So, that I, is something that I, I, um, I added. And, and you mean in the order like emergency needs? Emergency one, need is first, needs. then critical, and then emerging. Gotcha. Okay. I might just add some numbers in front of those. So then, yeah, we can certainly yeah. do so. Then on the page two, under the application process, I felt like, and it was also pointed out to me, that um, there wasn't enough clarity um, on when someone could apply. I thought it was clear enough before when it said emergency need, just contact me, and below it it said critical and emerging need, these are your deadlines. But it, that wasn't clear based on the calls that I got, based on other people that reviewed it. So I just added some clarity to the language of an emergency need that it can be any time by emailing me. That's because I at least want to be able to say, okay, do I really think that follow, before they take the time to fill out an application, does it really fall under this category of an emergency need? I tell people once they turn it, uh, once they contact me, I'll tell you if I feel like it fits in this category. I can't ever promise ahead of time that your, your um, funding will be approved. Then the last. Um, I just have a question. Yes. The dates. Is that supposed to be December 1st, 20th? Oh, yeah. 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 So why wouldn't it be January, September, October? It's every three months. This is just, these are just placeholders. So some of these might be Sundays or Mondays when I didn't. Oh, I was so going to say, shouldn't we start at October 1st, October, November? December? No, our, our, our fiscal year mm -hmm. is July 1st. So then okay, that makes sense. we'd go that way. But these are just placeholders. If I look at it again, that may not be actual the actual dates. The other thing, it was um, there was a suggestion to um, change the composition of the um, selection, the recommendation committee. At this point, 
This is one of the only times in my life I've been told I'm not talking loud enough. <laughs> Let me tell you that. Um, the selection process, it was suggested that, um, that we don't include um, non-HRC members on that, and I, I did seriously consider that. I think at this point, for folks that haven't been on it, I, I have had two HRC members, and then I've asked a colleague in my department, usually someone who does grant writing or grant managing on a regular basis for their job, and I f have felt like that perspective of someone who sometimes is, sometimes not as familiar with the nonprofit world, to have that interesting perspective on things, and I would um, suggest that we, we keep that. Mary and I, we take them in, and, um, but we are not um, voting members. So has it always been someone from CSD? It has been someone from CSD just because logically it doesn't. If this says CSD, it might say CSD. It actually doesn't have to doesn't be. Have to be. <laughs> it could just be but that's been your city practice. staff members. I'd have to think other departments in the city, obviously the, the, the library um, writes grants all the time, so that could easily be changed to a city staff member. I think um, when I wrote this, I was just in the guise of, mm -hmm. it's always easier to ask a colleague in your own department than it is to go across department, but um, that could easily just be, you know, another city uh, staff member. Gotcha. So um, those were, um, that's a quick overview, just to give you an idea of how this works. Council approved this policy based on the thought that these would go for um, critical and emerging needs. That was the whole discussion um, that they had during a finance committee meeting um, a couple years ago when they established this fund. When this was written last time, it went to council. So at this point, you know, I will take, you know, your suggestions in hand and then I will have a discussion, you know, with my supervisor, Monique, and then we'll have to make a discussion. At this point, do we feel like this has strayed too much from what the council originally thought of as emerging or critical needs? Do we, do we not? And if we do, and if it's something that this um, commission feels really strongly about, then we would have to look into the process of do we bring it back to council, do we bring it back to a, a council meeting, and then I could report that back to you all. I don't, I don't have that answer for you tonight because I wanted to have this conversation first. So that ends my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, do you believe the changes will increase the effectiveness of the grant? I believe that, yes, I do. I believe that the, the two bullet points under emerging needs will allow more people, more agencies to apply and, um, and also the change from um, three years to two years. That is my hope. Okay, perfect. Yeah. I, I, I really like the uh, two bullet points that you had under emergent needs. Um, you know, when I was reviewing this, I was trying to think of, is there a way that we can encourage sort of innovation um, in sort of the, the work that our nonprofits are doing? And sometimes it's hard for them to get funding, to start up funding to try out new programs without, um, without prior um, numbers on it, and so I think I, my read of it is that some of those elements are being incorporated here, and so right. I appreciate that. I, there was a couple suggestions to use language such as innovation grant or use this as a pre-type of HISRAP grant. My concern by using the words like innovation, mm -hmm. that, that strayed it too much from gotcha. its original purpose. I still, like I said, I can't tell you at this point what if in its mm -hmm. current proposed language where that will mm -hmm. go that's you know still you know may need some approval that may not get mm -hmm. improved in the end but i just really felt 
yeah. that strong of a language yeah. like innovation starter grants yeah. that that was not the original intention. Do you feel like the the spirit though is I, I, I read the um, I'm hopeful the approach to addressing the need is new. I feel like that sort of has the spirit so, of it as well as to develop or expand. Can I, can I I would say if we want to do an innovation grant, we should propose that to the city because at the end of the day, as somebody who has been on boards of nonprofit and runs a nonprofit, emergence and emergency and critical needs can happen as simple as losing funding streams. There could be a demand and a pressure, and we don't want the the fountain to be empty when somebody that is doing in community work goes to this to get that funding. Because I think, and I think that's a very clear thing. And we don't know whenever the market changes stuff happens we still have to be able to fund a senior program, a kids program that is in danger because if we chase innovation and we under underlie some of the other stuff. So well, I think Mika was trying to be very thoughtful with respect to that concern in terms of the funding prioritization in terms of emergency needs comes first, then critical needs, and then this sort of new category I, coming I, I, w I, would, I would be I would be strongly opposed to that. I would be like, I, I understand the two-year thing I think is really strong. And I love the order, but I would be opposed to putting any language around innovation and that because there are a ton of nonprofits and if having sat on the emerging fund board that are trying to do stuff that just can't find funding. And this, I think, is a very critical part. I wanted to ask you a question about uh, the progress of the uh, grantee to address the need that they identify on an ongoing basis. And can you give me an example right. of where that uh, has happened and where it works? You know, at this point, there is one grantee, all the grantees up until now, except for one, was a HISREP grantee and they applied for Emerging Needs Fund for things that were not part of the his rep cycle or was fell into the emergency need categories in the case of Cassie when there was the other death at the beginning of the year last year at, at, at Gunn. Um, I would say there is one grantee that we help with an, um, an emergency need that did apply and is being recommended for his rep funding this time mm -hmm. and that's Ada's. So they, they went up a, a little bit. They got like 2,500 uh, with this program to repair some equipment that broke down and now they're being recommended for a little, little over 5,000. So, but I haven't, because the volume has been so low, I have not seen it, if that was the intention of your question, as a jumping point mm -hmm. before, like a pre his rep jumping point. I haven't seen that yet because of the low volume. I'd like to ask about the um, funding no more than once in a two-year period. I can see that if somebody has come in with grant A and then they have another grant B and C and they're different, that maybe we want to limit it to one grant. But I wonder about an organization that needs a renewal at a second year to continue mm -hmm. a program. Right. If there is available funds and I mean, there could be caveats around it, not to, so we right. don't encourage it, but I would hate to see something get so close to being finished and then not be able to complete right. the task. I, I hear you. I, I, I could say, I'll, I'll answer that in two, year, two ways. I think going from three to two it feels like a, a jump for me as well because the real intent of this and the real intent that we heard from council is help people in certain situations. If you look at the... Um, the funding expenses, it really says, you know, um, that this isn't intended to support ongoing program work. Now, the program work can be ongoing in the sense that that program might have a crisis at that point. Mm -hmm. They usually get that state crisis and Washington is holding the funding back or that one funder is going down, but they believe and that program needs to get going right now and they believe by next year. But I don't think, I, I, I don't have a comfort level about having this be a mechanism for people to support a program um, multiple years. I guess I was thinking of a situation, I think the examples we used when we went to council were um, 
uh, the backpacks were stolen right. from, and so I could see, you know, the grant being, we want to replace the backpacks. And then we realized subsequently, well, there were no locks, and, or we didn't have a secure right. facility. So a renewal would allow us to finish the job. And right. I think, I think the intent of this was that to the level that we can, it's like a package that we're addressing, and we're addressing that package, and we're hoping the package doesn't have anything falling out of it that you need to take care of uh, another, another time. I, I think, I think um, most organizations, particularly when you do benevolence or caring for others, will have a policy that limits how much you can give to one party because, you, again, you don't want to drop the pool. And this is just a bridge. It's, we, I guarantee you, if you don't put the limit on it, the same people will come back to you every six months, ask, I'm guaranteeing it to you. And I think as a community, to be responsible, we have to say, we have, we'll help you this one time, but you have to become self-sufficient as an organization, or we can help with this one need, and then there are other mechanisms we can point you to. But if you make this a free-for-all, Minka will be dealing with the same person every two months asking for and, help. And to be honest, we, I may come back to you next year and say, I want to change it back to three years. Every three years instead of every two years. Well, our experience has not been that we have. No, our experience has not been. And I don't expect this, this huge change. But um, I, I'm doing this to, you know, open it up a, a, a little bit. Um, but I didn't. I, I guess taking your point, I see your point, and it makes sense to me, except that that's not been our experience. Maybe um, it's not. Safeguards. Well, and we still do. Uh, maybe the answer is not to change, in addition to the changing yeah. of the copy, that we, um, I know you advertise it a lot, but maybe somehow make it more well known in the community. Or right, that's a discussion that, yeah. that Monique and I can have um, regarding that, you know, Initially, it was, you know, our HISRAP grantees, our CDBG grantees, and really I sent it out to everybody that um, is on the bidders list for HISRAP. So that's about 35 to 40 local nonprofits, and, if, and it's more nonprofits in the human services field. Mm -hmm. So we are catching that net for human services nonprofits in Palo Alto, or serving Palo Altans, mm -hmm. is it's... It's not completely comprehensive, but it's not as limited. But that's a conversation we need to have as well. Or, and the committee itself and the fact that the city manager has to um, sign off is in itself an additional check to make sure that public funds are being used appropriately. I'm wondering if, if you have, have any sense of, you know, a lot of the agencies that do such great work in our community do such broad work. I mean, Avenidas came and told us about an overwhelming amount of different things that they, they do. Have we seen or could we envision a scenario where they have an emergency or critical need in one sort of sector that they provide service on and then to, um, next year they have another emergency or critical need in a different type of service that they provide? And would limiting it just to one sort of organization limit our ability to help serve two different kinds of emergency or critical needs? Right, it, it certainly can. I've run mm -hmm. into that once in the last um, in the last period where an agency forgot that they had asked, mm. or the agency was big enough so they didn't realize their one aspect of it had asked mm. for money when actually the the new need that they were hoping to apply for, which I said they couldn't, um, as the policy currently was 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 completely different. So I mm. do see that i i'm still i'm more of the cautious type i i i'm kind of like well let's do this change you know this is quite a opening the door sure. i think for the emerging need and then if that becomes you know if we want to say let's look at this again in a year instead of mm -hmm. two years and see where this takes us um we can go from there i and can you remind us when was the the last time council approved this? This was in, um, I have it in my report, it was um, March 2017. 
Okay, so not that long ago. Okay. No, it wasn't that okay. long ago at all. Okay, thank you. Minka, thank you for all your hard work on this. And, and your next step is... Uh, My next step, if, if I hear consensus, you know, um, that you feel good about this, then I will review this with my supervisor and then I could provide um, feedback at the next meeting as far as what the next steps are for this. Do we need a motion for that? You you can make a motion to um, um, continue to work. You know, that you um, are recommending the, the, the staff um, draft. Okay. You can do so. Ch Chair, can I make the motion? I would be honored to have you do that. Thank you. Go right ahead. Um, we'd like to ma make a motion that the emerging grants paperwork process be continued by staff um, and see where we end up for further discussion by this board. I'm sorry, I, I don't know what that means. Can you clarify? Basically, staff's going to work on it, bring it back to us, and when we have further discussion on it, because Minka said you just wanted us to say you can do further work on it. Is that no, correct? I, I want, basically, this is it. Okay. And th what I what I'm saying is that you are um, we're you know, approving. You're you know you're recommending the staff to staff that you are comfortable with this language, and then I will I will take the next step. Okay. And then I will I will let you know at a. Would you like to revise your motion? Oh, of course. I'd love to revise it. I would like to um, motion that the board commission recommend. That the emerging grant re emerging grants proposal rewrite is a, is recommended by this commission. I think that's the correct way. That's it, good. I think uh, Commissioner Brombach. No, uh, hmm? let there be a second. Yes, I just yes, had a comment. Um, mm -hmm. I think Minka wanted to discuss the name. We didn't discuss the name portion of it. I will it, take. I you know, we, we can do that now, or you can just send me suggestions. Yes. Okay. Yes, but thank you. I was yeah. going to say that. I will second the motion, um, and if I could. Uh, well, let's open it up for discussion yeah, now. Anybody want to discuss that? Is there unreadiness, right? Uh, if I could propose a a thought or a, a, a friendly amendment. Um, you know, I, I like the process that, that Minka has laid out. I think, you know, given that this was last reviewed in March of 2017, um, I think it's appropriate for us to to recommend um, the the revised copy as presented. Um, my sense from our discussion here is that you know we have a lot of different thoughts on it, um, and so I think um, if we can add to the motion that perhaps the HRC will form a ad hoc committee to um, discuss some of the ideas that have been presented here in greater detail, so that um, when the opportunity arises again to make any sort of revisions that we have those ready to go, so to speak, the next time around. I hear you, but it, it, after we operationalize it, some of those suggestions may play out to be a lot different. I think sure, yeah. I, 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 I'm fine with the idea of an ad hoc subcommittee. I think that might be more relevant in one to two years' time when we look at it now instead of thinking of ideas that, you know. Yeah. So my suggestion would be maybe to, in, in one year, form an ad hoc committee to, to reevaluate sort of how, how the new new policy is going and to f further dig deep into some of the ideas that we all came up with. It seems like there's a lot is of... There, is there a second for that amendment? Okay, let's go with the first one. Uh, and uh, not hearing any further discussion, uh, could we vote on the first motion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any Thank you all. Okay. All right. It carries unanimously. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. We'll move forward in our uh, uh, commission meeting to the third item of business, which is the next steps from March 11th, 2019's LGBTQ Summit uh, that was run by staff, uh, Commissioners Lee and Stinger. I attended. Uh, and it was a, a good experience held at the uh, library um, uh, art center meeting room. Uh, and uh, we'll try to stay on track if we can. So uh, let's see if you guys can make up about 10 minutes uh, with your presentation. So okay. Day 10. It's, well, no, you just another 20 it. minutes or so. I can time it. Sure. 
Um, I'm going to inter go review what we did on March 11th at the LBD LGBTQ Working Summit. Uh, the intent of the presentation is informational, but also to have your support for our continuing work, uh, which will probably take us into next year. I think we have some exciting opportunities, and I want you to be aware of them. Thank you. Um, what we're going to look at is the purpose, the attendant, attendees, the discussion questions, the outcomes, and the continuing work. Uh, the purpose of our working summit was to bring decision makers from key service providers and agencies together in a fresh form to assess the needs and select some initiatives for program services, visibility, and or space to benefit our population in Palo Alto. The focus came from the work we had done prior in the listening forum and in the uh, survey work. Um, we also hoped that the individual efforts, which have been successful but could be more successful, would be enhanced by uh, partnerships that would form at the meeting. The attendees, we had about 35, 34 to 36 people, I think. Um, representing, uh, yeah, I'll let you do that. Thank you. County and city governments, service providers, faith-based communities, and our city and school librarians. Um, I wanted to show this to you so you could see that we had a breadth of people. They were the leaders in, the, um, in their organizations. And it was really quite overwhelming. We had a list of maybe five key people that we really wanted. We sent out the invitations, and we were overwhelmed by the response. The power in the room when we walked in that night was somewhere between positive and scary. Um, the format of the meeting was to have two discussion questions. We had people sitting at tables, randomly sat at tables, to discuss what are the issues and needs. They presented those needs to us, and then we went to second tables where we were um, more selective. If they had a particular need they wanted to work on, they sat with that group and came up with a, uh, an implementation or a proposal. Um, this is where I can make up a lot of time. I just wanted you to see the numbers of ideas, the stickies that came up and the representative ideas, needs and ideas that were discussed. And I have to admit that uh, stickies get lost, so these are some of the stickies, representative <laughs> stickies. <laughs> there was a bigger pile. There was a bigger pile, and I'm sure that we could figure it out if we wanted to, but this gives it the idea. Um, the process led to five areas of potential exploration, visibility, activities, education, training, government, local services, and space. We, we basically just grouped all of the, the stickies together, and those were sort of the five categories that came together, and then we broke out in the second question based on each of those five categories. So a group um, sat together to say, what do they want to do for visibility? And that happened to be the table that I was sitting at. And I truly expected that group to say, we're going to put banners up, we're going to have buttons, we'll have door signs. And they're like, no. That's, that's, that's gone, that's past. It's, and you can do that so easily without really making a commitment. We want to do something like have third Thursday, fourth Wednesday, every month we're here to do something educational, do something social, intergenerational. Um, could be movies at um, different groups wanted to sponsor movies, bingo, family day, uh, Palo Alto Universities wants to uh, do a movie night, the Y wants to do a bingo night. Um, we can have family educational programs. So that was the visibility table. They were great. So I was actually at the um, activities table, um, and there were some comments about having LGBTQ specific events, but also just a sense of wanting to make sure that that community was very visible in all of the existing community events that we did. And so, you know, a lot of the, uh, the folks at the table you know, are involved with planning a lot of these events, and they were like, oh, of course, we can work on that right away, and so it seemed like just the fact that it was brought up in the meeting and it was something that was so obvious but no one had ever thought about kind of led to, uh, to folks saying, yep, it's definitely doable, um, just in terms of, 
you know, making sure that we do proper outreach to the LGBTQ community to make sure that they know that these events are going on and how they may participate. Um, and there may be, you know, ways to incorporate, um, you know, just greater awareness or topics around LGBTQ um, in, in, as part of a larger effort that they're working on. So. And a representative from um, City Parks and Rec it's took fantastic. that on and is already taking steps to work on a movie series and um, deliver that to families in early summer. Um, education and training, particular focus was, I'm gonna move through these quickly, was a uh, resource or a reference center in the city libraries. That's a great idea. And I think the, the interesting thing that came out of this was there was both a need to provide programs and resources for folks who were who are actively in need and in search of these services, but in light of our sort of unique demographics, also finding ways to provide those resources to folks who may not be actively looking for them um, and embedding them in some um, larger topics that may make those events and resources more accessible to you know, particular segments of our community and particular um, new immigrants and Asian American populations who may not actively be looking for those resources, but you know, finding ways to embed those in, in larger events so that people you know, get those resources um, without, uh, yeah. And then the, uh, the fourth of the five tables was government and other local services. And the request or the center, the focus there was on uh, providing sensitivity training, uh, providing sensitivity training um, initial training and refresher courses for people who worked with our, uh, mostly our young people. Yeah. Or, and we know that the city has already done that and is already doing that um, in some contexts, so we just want to make sure that we acknowledge all of the great work that the city is already doing Thank on you. that front. And um, request that we continue that programming because it's very valuable and appreciated. Uh, we looked there was a suggestion that application forms could be reviewed to make sure that they are inclusive and consistent yeah. across departments and could be a model. Yeah. And not for not only forms, but just any sort of government document or publication, just you know, wearing that lens to make sure that it's as inclusive as, as can be. And you know, from my standpoint, that might be something that one of us could easily do just by going online and, and, and taking a look. But. And just making sure that the language is contemporary and yeah. consistent across um, departments and across government and non-government yeah. organizations. Um, there was a focus on um, all gender restroom signage. Uh, the county has a program now of providing free uh, signage. To small businesses, yeah. And we could help promote that through, or we could consider leveraging uh, communication with the chamber to reach out to small businesses and provide signage to um, increase compliance with state law. Um, acknowledgement that mental health and other behavioral health services are inadequate for the LGBTQ homeless, but um, the partnerships with the Opportunity Center need to be explored. And that was a little beyond our scope of that one first evening. And there were some other proposals that were also beyond the scope of um, the first evening. So the agenda for the second meeting could be expanded to examine those. But let me talk about that in a second. The uh, piece that we did not look at was space. And that was because we um, had some illnesses that prevented people from the county from coming. But that work is progressing. And that will be a, a focus of the next summit in May. And I think that that can become a priority for our committee and we hope for the, um, with the approval of the commission um, to look at either dedicated space or uh, an RV, a, a mobile unit that could come, could provide mental health and physical and medical help to LBGT communities. And I think it's, and, um, with. With, the, with respect to this category, it may, you know, if the commission would like us to work on it, may require more involvement from, from the city or from the county. 
Um, it's certainly not something that the um, agencies could necessarily do purely on their own. I think in some of the out other categories, um, th there was a sense that a lot of that can, can be done by the agencies themselves, um, just getting together. But this particular category on space, if we wanted to pursue it, may just require more facilitation from, from us or probably more so from the county. Um, Fair. Yeah. Um, the continuing work would also be to, as I said, continue the development of the proposals that were made at the first meeting. Um, look at second level proposals. Some of the people would be ready to take on something different. Um, we don't want this to be permanently sitting in our court. So we do need to identify a steering committee so that we can ensure that this is a sustained effort and sustained commitment. Uh, it was interesting when we asked, I think I asked for a um, advisory board. No, nobody wanted to do that. A committee. Oh, yeah, we could do that. So we have interest, but we need to formulate that and finalize it. And we're doing a survey now, a doodle, to re pick a date. And uh, I think we'll do it May 8th or May 10th. Yeah. I mean, there, there was just so much energy and so much passion in that room and just so much momentum. We, we just kind of ran out of time. Um, and so I, th I think, Valerie and I think that a another group meeting might be warranted just to get them together so that hopefully they can further discuss some of the things that we talked about at the first meeting and help give them that continued momentum so that some what can be done individually or in, in partnership with other nonprofits can, can be done and we just give them sort of the framework or how, how would you describe it? The, uh, I, there the needs to be some initial kickstart Kick that yeah. couldn't happen in one two-hour session. It may be a second meeting is appropriate, but for space, we definitely need to come back mm -hmm. together to have the group say, these are the types of facilities, either temporary or permanent, that we need. Would you entertain some questions? Please. Um, it sounds like an amazing program. Um, congratulations on great execution, great attendance. Um, you guys are making a reference to a second step group. Is that the desire to get all of these 30 back in the room, or is it a desire to get 10, 15? What does that look like? Uh, the desire might be to get 35. The implementation will probably be 20. Um, We'll do it with. Um, I think that's what we get, right? Yeah, attendance and uh, a Zoom, uh, uh, internet access. May I make a short comment? Mm -hmm. So thank you um, for doing such a wonderful program. So lately, I uh, took uh, my son with a few co few colleges. So whenever uh, wherever we, we uh, went, so I'll. Uh, uh, LGBTQ is a big issue. So all the colleagues are trying to make sure, you know, so they have a good education uh, program in place, make sure all students are aware, you know, to protect the LGBTQ community. So I feel, you know, so I, uh, as a, a city, you know, uh, our community uh, members are doing a wonderful job. So when I talk to those uh, students and reps and the, the uh, professors at our place, so we feel, you know, no matter where we, we go, so, uh, you know, certainly we as a country put a lot of effort, energy in protecting this community. I think, you know, certainly I would appreciate the great work you guys did. I think one of the telling comments was somebody walked into the room and just said, I didn't know there was this much energy in Mid-Peninsula. And that was really satisfying to say that we could be that, that conduit for um, social, educational, and um, psychological Well, we look forward help. to the to the next update. I, you know, was there, and I second all your comments about the energy of the room. And, uh, you know, the, the issue of space did come up at my table. And uh, there were a lot of thoughtful uh, ideas about it. Mm. So I, I do think spending a little time on that is important because people had some very good local ideas. Um, 
And the other thing I would say is that just by holding this nice summit, you provided a space uh -huh. here in our community for a very productive discussion uh, where people identified needs and ways to implement uh, programs that would resolve those needs. So I think uh, that locale in the art center was just a, a fabulous safe environment for people to express themselves. And it, it worked out really well. The sandwiches were good. Uh, so thank you to staff the staff. Did such a yeah. great job. Uh, so I mean, maybe that was some of it. Uh, you know, people got fed too, and that was that was cool. So great work. Um, I was going to turn to the next uh, uh, agenda item to stay on track, and this is the uh, building community group. This is uh, also uh, Commissioner Stinger, but uh, Commissioner Smith. Uh, did some great work on this as, as well. Um, you know, as we we build on these successes, I know that, uh, you know, one of the things when we look for topics uh, that has come up of recent vintage is, you know, the potential topic of how we uh, speak civilly to one another. Uh -huh. And so I, I hope you guys can address that, uh, you know, because I think you know, one of the productive ways that uh, we as a commission can lead in civil discourse uh, is to teach people how to productively discuss their differences. And uh, the one thing I would say is that, you know, when we were uh, present in, let's say, the LGBTQ summit, we all tried to, you know, as staff and, and commission members, be part of each table. We have another resource, which uh, we all know about, which is the mediation group. Mm. And they're tremendous uh, in terms of their training. And in terms of civil discourse, that could be a, a wonderful way to kind of integrate them into our mission. So without further ado, I'll, I'll just ask Commissioner uh, Smith and Commissioner Stinger to report on item four. Um, we had a phenomenal first community conversation. Um, we, were, we were honored to have um, Dr. Dina Sterling um, from the Stanford GSB who has been doing research and study on gender equity. She handled the room in a very compassionate in a learning manner, um, we had some really good breakout table time. And I don't know about everybody else's breakout table, but I felt like the conversation was really rich and deepening and opened my eyes to certain biases that I had or certain things around gender equity that I really um, challenge, was challenged with. I think the thing um, Dr. Sterling so, so um, sagaciously pointed out is that some of our biases, we don't even realize that they're there, um, even around gender stuff. So I felt like it was a great first start. I'd love to hear, um, I like, I'd love to thank the commission for its overall support. Um, Commissioner Krellick was there, Commissioner Lee was there, staff was amazing as usual. So, I remember the cookies. They the were cookies also were so good. Uh, but uh, no, I actually sat with uh, the speaker. And, mm -hmm. uh, we're in the same group. Yeah, and, and she was a fantastic uh, uh, person to talk to about her background. Mm -hmm. And I shared some of my own uh, family issues with her, uh, issues about my wife's career. Mm -hmm. uh, that was powerful. And how difficult uh, this issue of gender equity uh, has been. And it is, uh, it's not easy in different environments, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's engineering, whether it's uh, science, uh, uh, whether it's government, uh, we're seeing wholesale changes. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think, you know, kind of recognizing this as a, a very viable current topic was sort of the first thing in my mind that, uh, that I uh, noted, and uh, people were ready to chat about it. Mm -hmm. that, um, was, yes. was, that was one of the things that I noted, that it's more about implicit bias and legislative change and mm -hmm. providing the venue and opportunity for people to talk about it and 
recognize their own biases and their own behaviors in a uh, safe space was very valuable. I think the process is, can be extended to other topics. Yeah, I, I really appreciated the uh, conversation at my table. I, for the most part, I tried to do mostly listening, um, you know, I, I, as a man, but I did uh, participate a little bit. Um, nothing really surprised me, just because I've been very steeped in gender equity issues for the commission for the past year or so. But what what sort of what I found interesting was just how intertwined so many of these issues are. You know, how gender equity plays off of, you know, the um, always on culture that we have here in Silicon Valley and the uh, the pressure that our kids fear on our schools to, you know, go to the good school and get the good job and just to be sort of the breadwinner and just how, how intersectional a lot of these things are and how they intersect with gender equity and so many of the other issues that sort of come across our table as commissioners. Um, and so I, I appreciated the opportunity to really delve into some of those intersections in, in greater detail than perhaps I'm used to. Um, so I thought it was a very great event. So thank you, Valerie and, and Coloma, for, for organizing that. So uh, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm grateful that uh, the, the event had an impact on people. Um, at, me and Commissioner um, Stinger had a follow-up phone call because we wanted to figure out ways to continue um, to continue community conversations that made sense. Um, we felt like we were not in the right position to dive into our next topic immediately, which was ethnicity. Um, the, even as we heard in the Alvanita's presentation, we felt like that needed like a September time frame. We needed to do some more groundwork. Um, I think May would have been too quick to really get and dive into that. Um, we wanted to offer to the commission to partner with another event that's happening in the community. Um, Dr. Jennifer Eberhardt just released a book called Bias. She is a MacArthur winning, she's a MacArthur fellow. Um, she ha has done some phenomenal work with the Oakland Police Department with watching um, the, the body camera tapes. It is amazing that um, the idea of bias, we generally look at it as a race issue, but even African-American police officers are more likely to shoot um, black suspects in the bias test because it's an American bias. Mm. It is not a racial bias. Um, she will be, she is, she is partnering with the University of Eastside Church, which I pastor, <laughs> and the Palo Alto um, League of Women Voters to come and speak on her brand new book. Um, she was on NPR the other day. What, um, what is her name? Jennifer Eberhardt. Her name of book is Bias. She's Stanford professor. She runs that entire department. She was actually the one that did all the research with the um, Oakland Police Department. Um, I think it's an easy win for us to be part of something. Um, so I'll leave it to my fellow commissioners. And, and when is that? Has that been scheduled? Already? May 1st. OK, so we would need to vote as a commission to what co-endorse that event you can co-sponsor it and well, sponsoring is, is if the city gives money right so we'd be endorsing the event um that is not on the agenda so you can't do either of those gotcha. i mean if it's may i would also defer to the chair because there is the desire to come up with the, the policy for uh, endorsing um events and so forth mm -hmm. so i will defer to him, but what day was it? May what? May first. May first. Yeah, so okay. that's not possible, unfortunately, because it's not agendized. We can't hold any extra responsibility. Yeah, community. This is a discussion item. There, it isn't an action item. Oh, I see. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Hopefully, you guys can make it. Can I um, ask for mm -hmm. some um, clarification from the committee? Is it the intention that the committee, um, as currently constituted, would plan all of the community conversations? Um, my, my memory may be serving me incorrectly, but when, when we discussed this at the retreat, my, my initial understanding was that the committee would, would work on the framework that would be repeatable, and so the specific conversations themselves may be done by 
different commissioners each time. I'm wondering what the intention is. Is, is it? We, would you like to continue the two of you to do all of the community conversations? Well, or? I, my understanding of it was that in this year, our job was to come with a framework. Mm -hmm. Our mandate was to make suggestions and recommendations and to see if we could start developing formats for community conversations. We, in our initial discussion, had not so finally um, parsed out the different parts of it because we were unsure of what it would look like. Mm -hmm. um, I wish I had known about the agendizing the item because I, I thought it was under the mandate of this group to actually present, and the last two weren't action items. They were just what we did. So I'll know for next time to make sure that we put it under an action item. And if I, I without going into great discussion on it, I, I think some topics that I would throw out as potential um, community conversations are on housing and not necessarily on a specific housing policy or housing project or a state bill, but really how do we have conversations about who we are, where do we come from, how do we get to know each other as members of the same community, notwithstanding our differences of opinion on housing. Mm -hmm. and I think housing is a very divisive issue and I've certainly, um, you know, in my neighborhood association heard stories of of quote unquote NIMBYs who have been told by YIMBYs that they should leave town and vice versa. Um, and that's the sort of rhetoric that, um, that gets so spicy it, yeah, at it, Starbucks. It, 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 it's that sort of, sort of rhetoric that sort of has disturbed me. You know, even if I disagree with someone on policy, I would never suggest that someone leave the community. So that might be something to consider during a community conversation. How, how is the, uh, uh, subcommittee able to receive suggestions from other commissioners on topics how do, I mean because we we have a limit on the number of people that can discuss topics mm -hmm. but right. is you, there a mechanism in place for folks to say to any, Commissioner Stinger and Commissioner Smith anybody can send them to me and I will send them to whoever is serving on the subcommittee okay I, I think that's a great idea so Steve if you have okay. those ideas I think uh, our mechanism would be in place, and that would help us with our uh, commitment to holding uh, clear public could meetings. I get, could, could I please ask for some clarification from the chair, though? Um, is it the intention that um, the current committee actually plan sort of community conversation number two and number three, or again, my can I make a suggestion I'm, that I'm we take that on at the retreat? To have uh, these two commissioners no, working. I, and, and that's uh, not an so uh, <laughs> if unless that excitement wanes uh, with the other members of the commission yes is the answer Can to your question we also did ask in I think it was a September October meeting for ideas so a lot of what we our work was based on this year was based on that we we're, we're we are totally open to ideas what I would like um, to know moving forward and for the record tonight is if our committee wants to have an event, what is the process moving forward? Because I know for our first event, I just gave reports along the way. Um, so I just want to be clear, what is the mandate is to do community conversations. What is the process? Do, do I need to send an agenda item that is an action? Or where would that fall into business? I mean, I, I, my sense is that that would fall under our discussion about how how do we want to endorse or sponsor events, either jointly with others or individually as a commission. Well, I think Let's he's see asking guidance two, here. I think he's asking two questions. I think one is is the is the mandate just for the two of them to come and say, hey, we're working on this event. This is what we think, you know, X, Y, Z. And at this point, yes, as the as the ad hoc subcommittee, you are. As far as the second aspect of it, I would not want to just in the guise of uh, a report, even if this was an action to say, hey, can you endorse this other event? I am anxious as soon as possible to have an operational policy for um, supporting and endorsing events so that everybody who has one ha can, um, can um, run it through that, that process. So th I've been um, looking forward to that. So if, if I'm understanding what I just heard, 
on the first point, if the committee wants to put on a standalone HRC event, then they have the, the mandate to do so already. Right. If it's a joint um, effort with another group or attaching to an existing event, that would require I'm not going saying through the process? That, no, I actually, I'm not saying that specifically okay. if these two commissioners said, hey, you know, the League of Women Voters is going to work with us on this event and so forth. My understanding with this specific event, it's their event that we are, they are hoping to have the HRC's gotcha. event, a okay. support of. Then I say it needs to go through um, just this, this, this process. If it's the other way around, if you're saying, hey, University mm -hmm. AME Zion, hey, you know, mm -hmm. um, Legal Women Voters, American Muslim Voice, would you want to partner with us on this event? I don't really feel like I want to set up a process that those folks have to come to you and say, is it okay that XYZ organization works with us on it? So I see it as the one aspect, and I'm, like I said, anxious to see that operational as soon okay. as possible. And, and just a point of clarification, so the committee can, can have up to three maximum, right? That's correct. So I'll just put it out there. If, if the committee would like additional assistance, I'm offering my, my assistance. If you would like it, or if, you know, none of, the, none of my colleagues express you know, interest. I think in all honesty, we're getting towards the next agenda item, which is the retreat. Right, and let's I think go the there. Retreat, I'm not saying it for the, the uh, same reason no, you are. I'm saying it for the reason that at the retreat, a lot of these things kind of reset to a way that people can honestly say, hey, that's something I'd like to help with next mm -hmm. year. That's something I'd like to help with next year. And, you know, it's not the, the point that this committee is trying to be exclusive. I think they're the committee that was the committee to do Last this year. event. And when we're in June, all things are, are back up again. Or just, just, just point of cl clarification. I mean, my understanding, and, and e from what I heard from Commissioner Smith, today was that the original understanding was to create a framework and format, which is different from actually putting on the events. But, but we, we can talk about that later. So my, my, uh, my understanding of what the committee was going to do I was slightly that, different. I hear that, but I think with all the best of intentions, no, of these two yeah. commissioners yeah. started that and the, and the mm -hmm. conversation morphed and they had some great ideas yeah. and they kind of came up with the, 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 a, a wonderful <laughs> event and that's where we are right now. And, and just the last thing that I would say is I, I would just w want to echo sort of what the chair mentioned in terms of the um, utilizing the Palo Alto mediators. I, I spoke with um, some of uh, Project Center North staff and that was sort of an idea that also came up in terms of, you know, these are folks with lots of expertise and training. How might we le leverage them in some non-traditional ways or ways that they may not necessarily um, work in, but would put those skills to use. So I, I would echo and agree with that point. Uh -huh. Commissioner Smith. Uh, uh, the, the one thing that, I, um, that I'm a little um, put back with is generally when a commission deals with issues, whether it's an event, uh, a thing, the reason we have Robert's Rules of Order is for the commission to vote on its priorities. So is that not a process? Personally, I would prefer there to be more of a process. Uh, I, even though we talked about all of these things at the retreat, we never formally adopted them. I went back through the minutes and, I mean, I, I think there was consensus, but we never actually formally adopted any of them. Okay. I would prefer a, a more rigorous process, but that's my philosophy. Well, it is a, it is a rigorous process because it is, it is, and one of the things that I am always want to be clear on is we run our meetings and our govern, govern, governance structure of this committee through Robert's Rules of Orders, which is a standard for how commissions and committees meet. And it is pretty rigorous if followed. I don't think, I think we ought to be careful adding infrastructure that, that makes things more complicated when we already have a structure which is motion, discussion, on readiness, vote. So I think this issue needs to lie tonight, but as we start really talking and discussing this, we either do it with, with, the, with the standard, which is Robert's Rules of Order, or we start doing different things. Because if something's listed as discussion, which is fair, 
then it can't be it can't be an action. So we need to make sure that we're we're applying all the same standards across everything. Thank you. Can I make a closing comment? May I make a Please. comment? Yeah. I at the risk of being redundant, I really want to um, say one of the things that I one of my takeaways from the first event we did was that personal invitations are very important to increase attendance and um, show our involvement and concern for the process and the topic. Um, Pastor Smith with uh, the League of Women Voters are doing a, a huge job putting together the May 1st event and I would hope that if I could send out invitations to each of you, you would attend and forward it to your friends. Jennifer Eberhardt is just a fabulous speaker. Um, you'll remember that my passion has been implicit bias. I've tried to make that my portfolio and I've wanted to have her speak to us several times and this we just walked into it and I think it's going to be a, a, a wonderful event. And it I'm just sounds to me like we underestimated your readiness here and uh, we won't do that again. Okay. Uh, let's move on to the fifth item which is the uh, June Human Relations Commission retreat. Staff is the speaker. Right. So we have, um, last year we did our retreat in June and I think we felt like that was a good time frame to do so. Yes, sir. Well, that, that's going to be challenging, so you better change those airline reservations. Okay. Well, we will need to see that is our intention to do it in, um, June. I know I am gone in July. So, and the the intention to do it at that time frame is that we have our um, new commissioners on board. We can um, get them involved right away, and that throughout the summer we can massage the um, programs and policies that you all are interested in, so that when September happens, it's kind of you know off and um, off and running. So that is. Um, the hope, I have been in touch with the person who did it last year. I made no promises, but I, I had the feeling that um, she had some really strong facilitation skills to be able to work us through some challenging conversations and to come out with a good product at the end. So I said that that would be something we would be um, discussing tonight. Um, often. Often this comes together with um, some, this, this type of meeting usually has the same kind of elements. We talk about what we did last year, what was successful, what were some of the challenges. We talk about what we want to do the next year. Um, last year we did spend some additional time getting to know each other, um, coming up some group agreements on how we wanted to work together. I think it would probably be helpful to say, hey, let's look at what those were did they work for us? Did they not work for us? We also had talked about um, coming up with a process which we followed to a point as when we had new opportunities presented to us. How do those, how do they fit in with what we already agreed to do and what process we would follow to slide something, um, something new in. So we did have some good conversations um, with her and I am, the, you know, willing to um, support um, the the cost of a facilitator again, but I, at this point, I'm just opening it up to what you, as a commission, feel would be important to have. Sometimes there's a subcommittee. Sometimes one person works with with me. So I'm just opening up the conversation. Did now. we have a June? Uh a uh, retreat last time or an August retreat? We had a June retreat. It was like the second Saturday in June. Okay. I, I just looked at my calendar, Benka. Yes, sir. I can do the 1st and the 15th. Okay. What I can do is, um, or maybe tomorrow, Mary can send out Is that a, Saturday 15th? Yeah. Send out a doodle I'll poll for next. everyone. It's going to be hard because um, we are going to have two new commissioners. Um, um, as, and they are, my understanding, interviewed the 29th of April and then appointed sometime um, like the first or second week of May. So they may be at the May meeting, they may not. Um, 
I'm trying to, that seems pretty similar to what it was uh, last time, that it was pretty quick um, turnaround, that for some of you, your first meeting was the retreat, and I heard some good things that that was a real good way to get acquainted with everybody and the, our processes and so forth, so. I, I really enjoyed last year's retreat, and I thought the facilitator was, was great. I think my only constructive feedback on that is I, I think I felt like we needed sort of 0.5 more time, like half a, an additional session just to really get into the nitty gritty of things and, and, and finalize things. It seemed like we were kind of, we had a general outline of what we wanted to do, but there were a couple of months where we were kind of just floating there, so. You felt like you needed that as a facilitated process? N or not necessarily as a facilitated, but. So I think it I think it would be good to have it as a facilitated process. Maybe not that day, but maybe a quarter later, like a, a Zoom call or something, maybe a little bit later in the year to see if we're sticking to what we're talking about. Well, we couldn't do a Zoom call because we'd have to worry I mean, about I, the Brown Act. But it, it could be that we could, if she's willing, invite her to the next um, HRC meeting to, um, to work through a process there or the commission would be willing to take an afternoon break and come back for a couple hours. Do you remember yeah. how long it was? Was it nine to two? It was nine to two or nine to three. We did a long session. It was a long. I thought. I think if we um, reduce the, t we spent a, a lot of time and it was well spent on um, different communication styles, and identifying north, south, east, and west. And that was interesting, and, and maybe we want to repeat it, but I think if we replace that with um, our issues for next year in a discussion and really hone, spent more time then on um, honing down from the proposals to so the... So we had a work plan when we left the door. I would be more comfortable with that. Nine to three. I, I think it's good, a good time spent. I mean, the, the more time we can do it up front, the less time hopefully over the course of the year we have to spend trying to find our way. So between the nine to three time frame, are, that's people would like to, within that time frame, have a work plan when they left the door? Or are we, there was one suggestion for a two-part. I mean, that this helps me in having discussions with, with Nancy. Um, I mean, I think there's some benefit in, in taking a, a break and coming back to it, whether that's taking an afternoon break or coming the next day or the following weekend, but it should be, in, in my opinion, within close proximity right. to that first session. We did an hour and a half on team building, Mary's bringing to my attention, so that was an awful long time. So mm -hmm. I think that could be um, looked at a little bit different. We made decisions for, this for that retreat based on the needs of the commission at that time. Mm -hmm. At that time, we really felt there was a, a, a need for people to come together to be able to understand each other and build the HRC as a team. And we would need to make that decision if, if that's still the need with two new members. I mean, at, at, in all honesty, at, at that point, once the two new members are on, it would be Commissioner Lee and Commissioner Stinger who are the longest serving members. So. It, it's a very young commission in, in that way. You guys are teenagers. <laughs> 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 well, I think we should go for an action item, which is to approve the, uh, uh, the June summit or the June retreat. Uh, could someone make a motion? Can, can I make the suggestion that perhaps um, a, a committee of yourself, the vice chair, and our formal Former Chair Singer, maybe work with, with Minkia on, on, on the details of that, or do you think that's not needed? You, you know, I, I, it's a, up to discussion. Uh, let's, do, do you want to so, have a, a motion? So I'll, I'll make the motion to approve a June commission retreat and that a ad hoc committee consisting of the chair, vice chair, and Commissioner Singer um, work on the specifics with the staff. So, it, 
assuming Commissioner Singer is, is willing. Yeah, why don't to we serve. do this? What, I, <laughs> what I'd like to do is. You uh, volunteered on me. Uh, yeah. yeah. I was like, <coughs> Weren't I was like, you they, the they, one? They, they all looked like flew over that time. I think like, this is really ironic because Commissioner Lee was the one who said to me that he'd like to have our process for how we establish who gets selected or yeah. who is chosen <laughs> to be on the commission. I was just saying it would be moment. subject to a vote, though. But yeah. let, 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 me, let me do this. I'll make the motion okay. that uh, the uh, commission approve uh, uh, a June retreat. And uh, if we can get a second, then we can have second. a second. OK, great. And let's have a little discussion about who would like to participate in the planning. Not I. Okay, uh, Commissioner Stinger, is that something you really want to do, or is that uh, really want to do, willing to do? No, I willing just, to. I mean, because I think you know. I uh, think leadership can. Yeah, carry I think it's work. fine. Yeah, why don't we do it that way? We'll keep it informal and uh, and you know. Thank you. It's. It's nice to volunteer people. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm willing to volunteer to myself. I mean, we just have a, a relatively young leadership team this year, but, but maybe staff um, will. Oh, can, I, can I push back on something? Sure. Uh, um, how, many, how many commissions have you been on? Two. Uh, how, how many commissions have you been on? Seven. How many, no, how many commissions have you been on? OK, I don't think we have a young board. Thank you. Like it, like it's it might be young to this organization, yeah. but but I serve with some distinguished commissioners that are. And this is not a rookie team. <laughs> I mean, you, me and you, yeah. But 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 I think I think, I, think, okay. I think we need to stop using that language. <laughs> but no, I just said you're you're you were wise. <laughs> All right, let's have a vote. Uh, we have a second. Good discussion. Thanks. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. We're going to remove, uh, move on to the reports from officials, commissioner reports. I'd just like to begin. Uh, I always like to talk about things that I do. I'm very proud uh, today to have attended the uh, volunteer recognition luncheon for the San Mateo Ombud Services. I'm one of 38 uh, volunteer ombudsmen. Uh, and uh, we make every year 5,000 visits and advocate for over 10,000 residents. And I know that Santa Clara County has a similar group, uh, but this was a really exciting uh, luncheon. Vic Lee was the host and received an award. He's a personality on uh, uh, Channel 7. Uh, there's some tremendous uh, people there. Uh, there was a gentleman who received a service award for 25 years, he's 92 years old, uh, who's worked as an ombudsman for 25 years straight, uh, advocating for the needs of uh, long-term care residents, uh, residents with uh, memory issues as well. And um, so wonderful organization, I think a real commitment to the community, and I just was very proud to, to show up. So uh, other commissioners, if you'd like to give a report to that again. I don't have anything to report. Um, I had a great time speaking with the Kiwanis Club. Um, I spoke some other place, but I forget. <laughs> yeah, I did one or two other community speaking engagements. I just can't remember what they are off the top of my head, but thank you all. Bye. Yeah, I've uh, started a big kids circle from uh, kids from the, with the Indian heritage. And um, just uh, started discussing issues they see in schools and things like that. And so it's uh, it's been good. Um, I a lot some of it was ins inspiration from you know seeing all the work that committees and people come and do here, and from you hearing all of your stories. So so uh, I don't. Is this my last one or is the no, next no one? Oh, next one I'm because if the new commissioners come, you said in May, then you know wouldn't there be like more than? Oh yeah, then technically there's a term. That's right. Your 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 term is till the end of May. Till the end of May. Okay, so then I have one more last one before I say. Right. We'll, we we'll would bring a cake or something. <laughs> exactly. I'm sure. We would not have uh, let that that pass. Yeah, that would there there would have been a huge party here. <laughs> I if, so that was a, that was a giveaway. Yeah. Okay, uh, Commissioner Stinger.
I have a, an announcement from County Supervisor Cindy Chavez is sponsoring a uh, program uh, on Children's Senior Family Committee Special Hearing on Sexual Assault and Domestic Violence. That was the first program that one of the commissioners did when I joined the uh, commission. And the county does fabulous work, so I will not actually be able to attend, but I was hoping that I could share this notice with other people. One, one other notice from the county. Um, the county of Santa Clara is giving away $5 million, $1 million for each um, district to support activities of um, underrepresented and minority or underrepresented communities in, in three significant areas, capital improvements, events, or, or, or archi archival work. You must be at the, um, the April 16th session, and I can, if, I can send you the info. Um, or you must have a, like a, a, a quick outline or a quick paragraph of what you want to do by June and the grant gets issued in December. But I think for communities that are looking for stuff, this is a great opportunity. All right. yeah, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Lee. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so I attended Coverly Day. Um, that was fantastic, seeing all of the different um, groups who operate out of Coverly. Um, during that event, I also attended Avenida's um, cultural club ribbon cutting. So that was fantastic to meet some of the um, other very engaged Asian Americans in our community and all the great things that they're working on. Um, Commissioner Stinger and I attended Mountain View's, um, their HRC's civility roundtable. Turns out their staff person is someone from my past. She uh, staffed the council member who represented my district growing up in San Jose. So that was a nice little reunion um, there. But I think we got some good ideas of, of things that may or may not work for Palo Alto. So that was a great event to attend. Um, I also attended Life Moves. Um, they had a, thought, a homelessness thought leader luncheon, um, which I thought was very fantastic just to see all the people along the peninsula who are working on homelessness in, this in, in, in their, their respective ways. Um, I met with uh, Ryan Flout, I believe, from the outlet. Um, you know, he had some follow-up thoughts that he wanted to share with me um, following our um, LGBTQ wor uh, working session. Um, let's see, I, I did want to make an announcement that I believe ACS is having their uh, Spring for Support luncheon on April 24th. It's here at the uh, JCC. Um, I'm planning on, on attending that, um, and I would encourage uh, my fellow commissioners too as well, just given the uh, very important work that they do here in Palo Alto. Um, I'm sure there were other things that I attended and did as well, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, First of all. <laughs> So that is Monique Lacanche um, Zenzenhenny, who is the Director of Community Service and Libraries, Wonderful. and my supervisor. Oh, hi. How are you? Well, great to have you aboard. Uh, as you can see, Minka is behaving, so. <laughs> <laughs> we we want to give you that good report. <laughs> Yeah, one time I questioned her in the elevator thinking she was from the newspapers or you know, yeah. so something like that. I'm like, you know. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for watching over us. We really appreciate that. Uh, the staff liaison report, we're excited to have our two staff members present. Okay. Um, just a quick report. At this point, it looks like we might have a joint study session with council at the end of August. So I do not have a date. It was just, you know, end of August. So we will see. Um, um, you know, the council is often very impacted, so sometimes those are, those are moving dates. So we haven't had one in a couple of years. So what that is is we meet 
often, well, the last time the, the, the conference room there was still available. Next time it may be in chambers. And it's really to share with council, you know, what we've been doing and what you've been doing and um, your thoughts for the next year, which makes it even more critical that you, you work on your um, goals um, in the early summer session. So that is, that's coming up. Can I ask a question about that? Um, so this would be my second joint session with the council, and I'm wondering, have any of the other commissions in their joint sessions ever gotten an actual formal direction from the council in, in that meeting? Not in my recollection. Okay. Usually it's a study, study session. session. Okay, because I know that um, at least me and a couple council members have, have indicated an interest in, in there being more direction from council to the commission as to some of their priorities. I know right. it just hasn't come together yet. It hasn't. So I don't know usually, how that. they. I. That's really. You know. Once. The, the hope is once the council has had that study session, when they're doing their planning, they, if they're, they feel a need for the HRC to take on a study or a project for them, that will, that will come okay. down the line. But that's really a time for them to speak okay. as individuals to give comment and feedback. But it's not a point where the HRC can go back and say, oh, we got council direction to do X, Y, and okay. Z. So it's really up to council initiative if they wanted to follow up with Correct. specific. Correct. Okay, thank you. But isn't the mandate of our commission to explore the community, to feed information to council for spots they might not see information on? It, it's, it kind of goes both ways. Okay. So there are things that are on your list to do. There are things that they could give you to do, but it also, they, they welcome you being the eyes and ears in the community and bringing I, uh, issues to their attention that are should be addressed at their level and not at commission level and whether they whether they choose to take them up is 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 really their decision but yes it it, it definitely can go both ways okay thank you so much okay um the um request for proposals for mediation administration that should be going out um early next week the other thing that I followed up on, and I did not do this with the intention of stopping any future HRC conversation on it, but I just for due diligence did some follow up, was with the, um, was with the concern that Commissioner Bromblot gave regarding um, the vote for chair and vice chair and the, the concept of that if, um, in the vote, the person with the most votes gets to be the chair, and the m person with the uh, second less votes would be the the, the vice chair. Um, and uh, the the feedback that I got from the city attorney is um, that any vote to take any action by the commission needs four votes. So technically, if there's a vote for per four people, mm. you know the the. The top vote getter in that situation got four votes. The second vote getter would be three votes. So the HRC in the municipal code or any commission can't take a vote unless the majority of the commission um, designates that action. So if it, if the if the motion was this person will be chair, this person will be vice chair, and it was in one motion, and that 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 ticket got four votes then that would um, constitute a majority of the commission and something that would pass. But it, it can't just automatically be that because by default, something to pass, it's going to be four, and then the second person got three, and the commission cannot take action on something with only three votes. So um, that doesn't mean you all can't have these any other further discussion on that, but that is in the municipal code. It is the same process that all other commissions um, follow. So I just wanted to give you that um, that um, information back. And I am off next week, but Mary will be here. Okay, we're going to move on to the tentative agenda for the next regular meeting. Uh, I see here a date Thursday, May 9th. Is that the next regular meeting? Okay. Um, and it says selection of commissioner to craft human relations commission recognition policy. Um, I don't know, uh, is there a, an, another suggestion for our agenda next meeting? Uh, go ahead, Commissioner Stinger. Um, I wonder if 
you would be interested to Polly in doing a learning session or learning series for us. I'd be interested in what issues you're surfacing with the population of teens that you have in your circle. Some of that. This meeting or next uh, meeting? Next meeting. Uh, next meeting yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. I can do that. Yeah, okay, no, I, I've been I host, heard hosting. Three seconds to that, so I think she's on. <laughs> We're going to give you a little bit of a platform on the way out. <laughs> yeah, no, basically, what we do is um, I mean, I, I found it uh, very helpful when I was growing up. Um, in um, middle school and high school, like we would uh, sit and do a prayer and um, meditation, and so I wanted to give something similar to my um, to my son growing up. And uh, so what we do is uh, we we uh, once a month we invite kids um, who are in middle school or high school, and we sit in a circle. Um, we uh, do meditation, and then. Um, we talk about um, whether they feel they're um, Indian, whether they feel they're American, things like that. If uh, you know, if they see something um, of a, you know, uh, yeah, bu you know, bullying issues or whatever is on their mind. They, you know, there was this. Uh, the movie was uh, there whether they had watched. Uh, one of the popular movies was you know the uh, I forget the name the hate. Um, yeah, the hit you get that was being discussed at in school, and so you know, well, we had a discussion on that. Would and, you uh, uh, kindly uh, talk to uh, uh, our staff members about how to frame the agenda item? Would that be okay? Uh, just maybe uh, send them an email with the, the framing of it, and and we'll put it on the agenda. It's uh, it's just uh, yeah. I'm, I can send them an email, think about it, and how to Great. phrase it, and then thank you very yeah. much for doing that. Yeah, so it's 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 interesting. Like a lot of these kids, like usually they will not talk to their parents, but when they are in a circle, they feel mm. part of the community, and you know, think, things come out and they say they they say things. Okay. So it, yeah, it has been it has been good. Okay, Commissioner Smith, you had <laughs> an idea for the agenda um, process. We discussed it tonight, so might, might as well make it an agenda item. What are the recommendations for the process that we discussed tonight? I, I think so that's I what mean, this, this is. The uh, is that what, what no, this? Well, item no, is? that was you had suggested that a commissioner be selected next time. I mean, the to develop the policy right. around the process. Y you can, or you can just select a person or a, a subcommittee, or you know, now that that can come back next time as and, a process. And nominate okay. Commissioner Lee to be our be one of the people on that. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, I, I think, yeah, I think one of the things that, that I um, noticed is that it's a little bit difficult to have uh, a commissioner that's serving on the uh, leadership team do that. So uh, if you have ideas about how to craft a recognition policy, that would be great. Oh no! We, I actually. I was uh, talking about the um, about the event policy and the endorsement policy. That's the one I'm actually d wanted to discuss. I think what we should do is we should we should make this both not only the recognition but the event and endorsements as well. Is, and, do I have a, a, a second on that? Or second that? Okay. And I, I, so I we'll would broaden that uh, if we can. can. Or and I would suggest that we even broaden it even further. Just I mean what what Minka mentioned in terms of needing four people to for the commission to take any action that that particular provision of the code really resonates with me and I'm a very structural and process person and I think we we may need to get back into the habit of, of doing more votes to authorize commission action um, and so I, I think it's more than just events and recognitions but also just general process so we can pull that in there if the chair can is I appropriate I, I can I, I, I caution against making something so big that it doesn't, you know, I mean, that's a process for four votes seems different than coming up with a process for um, endorsing events. That, that sounds more like a, a class on Robert's Rules of Order 
been I been a process. Which now is <laughs> Rosenberg's role of voters. It is, it's Rosenberg. It yeah. is Rosenberg. I went to a training. <laughs> they, they, yeah. they, somebody changed it. They they, they stole my rules. No. See, <laughs> Rosenberg's rule of voters. That's what the city follows. So, now. so so I think I think there's there's two different things. The commission understanding how we should work in a meeting and what we should vote on is, I think, a review of Rosenberg slash Robert slash Roberta, because we want to cover everybody, uh, <laughs> rules of order. And then I think what we're talking about here are two very specific operational things that need to happen, which is endorsement or retirement. What is it? Retirement? Recognition. Recognition. And yeah, events. I think one of the, you know one of the big criticisms is uh, you know we have to have some uh, some effort in the game uh, with events. You know we can't be latching on our uh, <coughs> promoter to things that we don't do anything for, and and so that is just one example of where I think we need to have a senior leader. A commissioner, uh, I will tell you that I will likely propose Commissioner Stinger to be the person that crafts this, and I will likely propose Commissioner Smith to be the person that administers it. So and the idea is that we have to have a mechanism to feed uh, proposed recognitions of events, people, uh, co-sponsorships uh, so that we don't go over mm -hmm. the number of commissioners uh, with respect to the Brown Act. And so what I was envisioning, just so that you know this, is, you know, having a just a short written proposal that says, if we have these things and someone proposes it to staff or to Commissioner Smith, then he would then bring that up to staff as a uh, agenda item that could be voted on. And the idea is, is that, you know, my short experience has been that too many people talk about it mm -hmm. ahead of time. And that just, you know, then, then we run into issues that we had in the very first meeting where there were four people discussing uh, some kind of a, uh, you know, a, a promotion of a library event. And, you know, there were some really good comments about that. The one comment that I heard was, well, what do we do for that event? Mm -hmm. And so, so I, w I want to just frame this in a way that is selection of the commissioner to craft the recognition policy the policy uh, for co-sponsorship, uh, the policy for uh, promoting events uh, as the Human Relation Commission. Yeah. And once we select that person, then that person would, you know, next have one individual who would be responsible for that. And so that's where I was going with it. Uh, that's the kind of thing that I want to discuss. Um, can I just interject? We're getting really close to discussing something as an uh, like an no, agenda I'm item. To describe when the topic right, a little bit. Better. I I I I definitely hear you, Chair. But I, I the the extenuating conversation on this. I think at this point the decision has to be one of two things: either you are selecting the person next time to develop the policy, yes. or you are you are review having someone do that between this meeting and next and you're reviewing the policy next time i think that's the that's the that's the i think the, the way it's written now. is fine which is to select the commissioner to craft the, the recognition policy etc as we've stated so the policy we, itself wouldn't be finalized potentially until june that's after. right that's right okay. yeah and that would give give uh, the person what is the motion i'm i'm so confused it's not a motion no it's, it's just the, the agenda, agenda item the agenda item so what is the agenda item for next time? To select someone to work on it. Could what was the second option Minka gave us? 
Well, you, you, said, said, you could do it any, any different you, way. You, you said just, we can pick somebody no, now. No, uh, in listening to the conversation, I'm just saying your option is to select the person to do it next time. I don't specifically. That's not an agenda item this time, unfortunately, right? That is, I'd have to maybe defer to Monique. I don't think any, every time you select someone to do something that it needs to be agendized. Or is, it would be an action of the commission, right? Just because my understanding was sometimes people say, okay, you do that, and it doesn't have to be a vote. But I mean, we haven't really I have, followed I that have, process. Yeah, I think my direction here. Yeah. You said you're, it's very consistent in your application of that of saying you or Chris. Okay. And so I would not only be at the next meeting would be discuss, you know, deciding who or if it's an ad hoc or whatever, but you'd also be having a discussion about. So, and recommendations. Mm -hmm. so that I, I appreciate that ex, uh, uh, that um, I can't even think of explanation. now explanation, but uh, you know that um, you know that furthering of the topic that it could be picking the person, but it's already that this group could give that person ideas. Oh yeah, I mean it's a discussion and an action item, or it's right. Be the same thing. Right. Input. Yeah, I realize that, but as it was written, I don't think that yeah. was the intention, but I think that is a but good I think that's segue. What you guys want to do. Yes. Yes. I have another <laughs> agenda item I'd like to propose, uh, which is uh, an update on the, uh, the bias conference uh, that uh, Commissioner Smith has identified. I wondered if someone would second that. I will second that heartily. And um, is the commission interested? I'm not sure what I would do, uh, possibly our city transportation staff, but hearing another conversation about transportation in another aspect. I mean, there's our, the city shuttle program. I'm not sure what their staffing is like now, if they have the capacity to send someone. Is there another transportation for vulnerability aspect? Because that's what we're really that's kind of the framing of this conversation. Are there other suggestions that people might have that I could look into? A learning series again? No, 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 no. Within the learning series of transportation, so we asked Avenidas, I know there's an interest in having city shuttle staff, but is there another person or agency um, that might have information on transportation needs or transportation provision for vulnerable populations that you'd like to hear from? Perhaps VISTA or some, something with a um, abilities dimension to it? Okay. I could see some uh, public uh, entities that provide transportation. Okay. Uh, also Stanford University uh, in their transportation systems as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, could could also be, you know, the uh, Caltrans or other, you know, okay. bus groups. What about, I don't know if BTA could speak to us about Route 22 changes? They, uh, actually it was in the paper that they're not gonna cut the overnight service. Yes, Thank you. you're welcome. You're not cutting the overnight service? They're not gonna cut overnight services. A lot of people are very happy about yes, that. Yes, I know. And that's all that, oh yeah, it wasn't my section still. I think we're done. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a couple that I'd like to suggest. I'm excited to hear it. Okay. Um, so this one is not new. I think we had mentioned it at the last meeting. Um, to the extent that the chief is available to give us um, a presentation on SB 1421, I, I believe he was unavailable. This he was time unavailable. Um, there was an article today in the Palo Alto Post that there was the two cases were released. So, um, so those two cases were there. The, that were in question were released. I don't have any more information other than what I saw in okay. the paper today. Can, can we tentatively see if he's available? Um, I think you had expressed interest in, in having him come as well, Chair. The question becomes, if they release, the, if, if they are released, is there still a topic to talk about? That would be my question. And also, um, Commissioner Onan, I know, had a meeting with the chief in- I also did. Thank you. And Commissioner Smith in their roles as liaisons. 
I mean, I, I, I think that there's still value to the public in, in having having him come and present and provide a, a forum for the community to talk about it because it's sort of split um, up and down California as to whether you should release it or not. Um, I'll have to take a look at the articles and see if it changes anything on it, but. Um, I would leave that to see if you, if you have a second and I'd need to check in again with the, the chief and his staff. Is there a second for that request? Yeah, sure. I can second that. Thank you. Um, also, um, the county board of su supervisors has, has directed their staff to uh, come back with proposed changes to their ICE policy. And given that this commission um, in the past has, I believe we sent a, a letter of endorsement for one of the uh, Senate bills on that topic um, to, to Sacramento. Um, and so I think it may be timely for, for us to, to revisit that discussion um, and if necessary, uh, weigh in on it. Um, I know their Human Relations Commission did not have a chance to do so, just given how, how um, the timing worked, but you know, given that this commission has best interest in it, we may want to form an ad hoc committee to see if, it's, if we want to take any action on it or maybe, maybe the decisions now, but um, I think that might be an interesting topic. Um, and then my last one is um, sort of a question. Oh, pause a second. A second, a second nice. Okay. So can you repeat, it's, it's a the, state senate bill? No, the, uh, the, the, the uh, county board of supervisors have directed their staff to um, draft revisions to their ICE policy. Um, and it happened, what, maybe yesterday or the day before? The ICE department or for what? The, uh, it would probably involve the sheriff department, right? Yeah, it was just the county, how the county um, interacts with the state and, and federal. And, they and made exceptions you, to um, the hands-off policy. I think if this is something that does get a second, I need some more clarification. Sure. And to check with our staff if, if there are any operational policies that um, would be affected at all. That I'd like to know, yeah, I'd like, like to know what is the topic because it's, it's the county's it's, ICE that is policy. A, right, but that's a news item. So are you, do you want to review their new policy? I, I'd like uh, uh, the or commission. Or would you like somebody to come and talk about the new policy? No, I, I, I'd like the commission to consider whether we want to weigh in on the proposed changes. So, to the county's policy, okay, yes. Okay, so should we wait until they are made? I mean, I think it's an evolving discussion, so we can at least get the ball rolling in terms of forming an ad hoc committee to look into it. When will, when will the final language be from the, when will the county make its first uh, report uh, on I, it? I, I don't know, but this body only meets once a month, so. Okay, so you, if so. If we wanted to start looking into it, we'd have to. So, so can we make, time. can we make an investigative look so we have clarity so we know what to do next yeah, time. Yeah, why don't we have the staff look into how to get updates on their draft policy. Okay. And then we can decide. Oh, uh, well, but even if we even have a commissioner come back and say this is what their draft policy is and this is what they're saying and this is compared to our previous statement that we made on this. So, so maybe uh, the agenda uh, item is an update from me. I'll, I'll do some research into it and provide an update about what's going on um, what their timeline is, and but if we can also make it an action item, should the commission at that time decide that it want to f wants to form an ad hoc committee, it has the option to do so at that meeting. I'd like to see. Can I uh, make a suggestion? Yeah, I'd like to see someone from, you know, this county supervisor's office, you know, provide us with an update. Okay. To That's tell good. us, you know, what is their their outline? What are they trying to do? so that we're not operating in the dark. And, and I think, you know, given that there's been a vote and there's an activity, someone there, I don't know, Mika, if we can make a contact to have someone report on their, uh, their operation uh, in trying to change it. They may describe, you know, steps of meetings. Uh, yeah. They may describe uh, timelines. But what, what I would suggest is maybe the action item or the agenda item can be uh, report on the Board of Supervisors' efforts to change the ICE policy. 
uh, so that we're operating in, in light as to what is going on and maybe we can actually participate. Mm -hmm. can, I, can, can, I, can I make a, a recommendation? Um, I think you do need, you we, we would need both paths because what I found oftentimes with most situations, there is definitely two perspectives. So the county could provide a perspective that says, this is our thinking. Um, Commissioner Lee could research communities that are impacted by it and say, this is the thinking. So I think, I, I think in order for a, com a commission to have real good clarity on it, not only do we need to hear from the governmental body, we also need to hear from the community body. So, well, we could, in fact, we, you know, I think we could follow it up with uh, uh, agenda items that would include uh, discussions. If, could I make a suggestion? Uh, yeah, please do. I think if you can do some of the legwork and some of the, um, raise the questions, not the answers. Sure. There are some, we've been contacted by uh, immigration specialist who wants to do a program and maybe we could if that becomes a priority for next year we could we would know the questions to frame the program I think I'd like a lot better understanding about the, the time frame for all of this to be able to so I would think, I think that is the first step I think at this point there should be some exploratory work right. um, per the com per, per the chair something to the county that says what what are you have put together a commission what even are you putting it what why is this commission even together to change what are they changing and what is the goal because we right now all like to to the chair's point all we have is a headline we're also going to ask commissioner lee to do some uh, some more exploration from some other sources and we're going to determine if the next time does this warrant a further discussion or not in further discussion. I think I want to, the first step to be just I'll, I'll be in contact with um, my contacts at Supervisor Simidian's office and to get a better sense of it and then I can be in discussion with the, the leadership team. Yeah. But I have heard, you know, if, if this is something that's, is it going down in the next, you know, month, two months? Are they doing all this work over the summer? And the the board's going to consider this next December. So I don't have any idea of timeline. So I feel like I need to get a better understanding of that. If you have some information, Commissioner Lee, you want to yep. forward to me. But I, I would like, I'm not saying no to the next agenda, but I feel like I need, I, I have no sense of this to be able to inform how we could, how the HRC could best discuss this. That's very important. Okay. So, 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 so well, where does this leave us? No, we have an agenda item, uh, but the agenda item uh, is subject to inquiry by staff, and, okay. and I think that's the best way to go, uh, based on the fact that the staff needs an understanding. Okay. Commissioner Lee, you have can I, one can, more item. Yeah. Can, I, can, I, can we stop for one second? Um, and just because I've been working with a lot of people of Faith in Action and Louis Angel and some other people in, in the immigration thing, and at protests in San Mateo and down in Santa Clara, I really, I think in order for us to do fair fairness to this, we're going to need more than the county perspective. I don't feel comfortable hanging my hat on that. I'm not just saying the county's perspective. I'm trying to get, I would try to get an understanding from the county on the process and the timeline. That doesn't mean just the county perspective, okay. but that's what I don't have a sense of now. This is the first time I'm hearing of it, and I'd like, again, as I said earlier, are they looking, or is this something that's going to be a quick turnaround on the mm -hmm. June mm -hmm. board agenda? Is this something for December? That's my first step, okay. just to get a better sense of that part of it. Okay. Yeah, and, and the other thing also is that I think uh, to the extent that we identify the ability of members of our commission to participate uh, in meetings. I think this inquiry that staff does could, in fact, allow us to have an impact mm -hmm. on this issue. Go and ahead, please. If I can read this, um, the vote was taken two days ago to explore the policy. Um, two proposals put forward by the board would authorize the staff and local 
law enforcement to investigate possible mechanisms for a policy shift and report back within 60 days. So, yeah. And, and, and so, did so, they, yeah. and have they clarified what they're shifting in the policy? Because yeah, yeah, the, the immigration policy is like about this thick. I think the po yeah. I think the policy change was with regard to uh, uh, illegal immigrants without papers who have a, a record, a criminal record. Yeah. So, so if this commission wanted um, the opportunity to weigh in on non-city policy or legislation, which is within our purview, it seems like it's pretty time sensitive. But I'll defer to staff on that. My last point or recommendation for our next meeting is. Um, let me ask a question. Do we happen to know when the point in time sort of count and report will be done? The homeless the HUD mm -hmm. count? That is usually, I, yeah, I should know that. Um, did they talk about that at the SPIN meeting? Oh, but it's not, any, it's not anytime soon though, right? No, I don't think it's, it takes a while. Okay. I think the next one is until next year. Okay, it's then. not in the summer period, it's usually, okay. um, then, then I'll hold my request on that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. That's it. Thank, thank you, Chair. I think we've uh, reviewed everyone's um, proposed agenda items. If, if I left something out or someone out, could you speak up now? I think you did an excellent job. Okay. Um, I move to adjourn. Uh, we'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting, and thank you very much for your participation. Thank you.